Good morning, everyone. Oh, we're so happy to see you. We, we now have five screens worth of people on my computer. This is so wonderful. I'm, I, I'm really happy that you're all here and I'm hoping to be able to see all of you. Um, Christy, when, um, so Kitty's gonna leave about 10 minutes to 12 because she has a very important uh, meeting about her, her uh, exhibit. And, um, and that's on the website so that any of you that want to see her exhibit virtually, we now don't have to travel there. We can see it on, online, so that's so great. Um, so she's gonna leave at 10 minutes to 12. And I'm wondering, Christy, if, um, if we're gonna hang out a little bit longer so people can see each other and say hi. We, we can do that. If people want to do that, we are no problem. And people can keep asking questions even after Kitty leaves. Yes, absolutely. Of the other So I wanted, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, so this questions. is how it's a little bit of housekeeping to start with. This is how um, I see it working and um, <laughs> who knows. Um, so we have people here, we're calling them the panel who are officially here to to respond and, and, uh, um, and tell about their particular, you know, Kitty's gonna go through a certain amount of PowerPoint and tell us a segment about oh, our beginnings. And then it's gonna open up to our panel and that will be um, the different people responding, so uh, that that are part of part of the history of this. And meanwhile, you can be um, you can be chatting. Or you can be chatting, but you can put questions in the uh, chat box, which Christy and I can see it too. Which we can see what your questions are. So some convention now is that you put three, I think you can just put a question mark to start with and then put your question in so we can recognize it's a question and we can pay attention to you, to your question. So what will happen is that we won't ask you to physically uh, ask it, but we will, um, so Kitty will show her PowerPoint, uh, people on the panel will respond, and then anyone who has pointed questions toward that, uh, Christy will read the question and then uh, our panel will answer what they can. So, and the panel will be raising their hands. So electronically, I can see them. And it depends on where you are as to how you raise your hand. Some people will go into reactions and find it there. Some people will go into participants and see it there. So uh, it, will, it will just depend on where you find it. But um, if you're if you're doing this, I may I may not see you, and uh, and then the panelists, what's going to happen is that um, when after Kitty does does the PowerPoint and releases it back to the room, then uh, I will be calling on you and I will spotlight you so that everybody can see you because otherwise sometimes things are bouncing around. So it's just a less confusing to be able to spotlight you. And then when you're, when you're done with your answer or your response, I will remove the spotlight and we'll go back to, to the general view, all right? And so I think I think that will keep us a, a, a little bit organized <laughs> because definitely we could chat all day and have a good time. So, um, so that's that's what we're doing. That's how we're going to run it, I think. And um, you know, I'll do the best that I can with this, and just um, so welcoming all of you and and all of the wonderful people we have here and people who've shown up. <laughs> we're just. You know, this is what we're all about, right? I, uh, I think this is one of the most supportive uh, groups uh, that I've I've ever known. We aren't in competition with each other; we support each other, and I think that's just that's just the most beautiful thing ever. So, um, Kitty, should we? Are you ready? I know you're ready to go. <laughs> I don't have to ask that question. Um, and let's see, we have. Um, we have a lot of people, people are, are coming in, but I think it's time now, uh, we're almost 10 minutes into this, that we should start the PowerPoint. Is that good for you? Sure. So Kitty, go ahead, uh, and um, I'm gonna remove the spotlight for me, and Kitty, go ahead and uh, start your share. Okay, so here we go.
So can everyone see that first page, Janet? Absolutely, yes. Wonderful. Yes, I'm everyone. Yes, we can all see it. <laughs> You're representing <laughs> everyone. So this is, you know, truly, It's showing very well, dear. Truly exciting to be here with all of you um, and to share the beginnings of the Society for Calligraphy um, to try to pin down some of the dates and happenings and the people uh, to um, get it a little bit more definitive because I've talked about the beginnings, so have many um, other members of the um, uh, of the group. So uh, I just thought maybe this would make it more official, make it a true oral history that everyone can participate in and add corrections and so on as we move forward. So we have our panel of general uh, char charter members that we've been able to um, uh, is, uh, gather together. Some we gathered and then they couldn't come suddenly. And so, um, so with Bruce Bishop and Nancy Campbell and Nancy Ochita Howells and Marita Sheeran, I'm so delighted that you could all be here. And uh, Salima Nimoy, uh, Maury Nimoy's daughter is here to talk about Maury and her experiences with him as a calligrapher. And uh, Donald Jackson, uh, who of course we know is an honorary member of the Society for Calligraphy and dearly beloved. Thank you, Janet, for moderating everything and Christy for um, arranging this Zoom. Notice on the right-hand side that everybody who was a um, charter member got this beautiful artwork by Dick Stumpf uh, to uh, note that they started the Calligraphy Society. So um, here we have uh, just some ancient pictures of what happened at the beginnings of the society. They're kind of random, different dates, but I just thought I would point out certain people in case you didn't know who they were. Mostly I'm trying to highlight the uh, panelists and people on the ad hoc committee. So here's Maury Nimoy, uh, Alan Cameron, Larry Brady, Miriam Halpern is one of those two, and I think it's here. <laughs> and uh, Marsha Brady over there and Bruce Bishop over there. And uh, sorry, when people come in, I can't move forward. So I'm going over here. All right. And so another picture, ancient picture from 1983 with Rena Wills and um, Bruce Bishop, Julian Waters and Lefty Fontenrose. And Nancy Ochita, Howells and me at my MFA exhibit at UCLA, wonderful, fun memory. In fact, there's a picture of one of my most unusual books I ever made at that time uh, called A Book Tree with calligraphy and the, the pages kind of open out over time. Here's at uh, La Casa de Maria retreat with Tom Gordy and Miriam Halperin, David Meckelberg, and somebody please help me remember who that lovely woman is and um, Pat Topping below her and uh, Bonnie Barrett, Janet Weber and me and uh, Nancy Campbell here with her friends at uh, some event. And so I just wanted to give you an overview of what we're going to do today. I uh, had Christy send you the outline, so that should uh, be at hand in case you want to refer to it. But we're going to be, going to be starting about the organizations uh, before the society formed and who were the main actors in getting that to happen. People who were teaching because of uh, Maury Nimoy's and Donald Jackson's influence and all of the people that helped uh, work on uh, getting the Society for Calligraphy formed. Then we had our big meeting, to be or not to be, um, the birth of the SFC. Then um, some of us went up to Manuka Retreat in Portland to do some research. And then that all uh, resulted in the, um, um, the denouement of the annual general meeting with Lloyd Reynolds and then going on the road uh, with all of our programs, culminate, culminating in this um, exhibit at the Pacific Design Center. And then just a quickie uh, listing of the things that have happened since the society was formed. And then to remind you that we will have our 50th anniversary in 2024. So here we are setting the stage, calligraphy organizations before the Society for Calligraphy. So the Western branch of the Society for Italic Handwriting was in Portland, Oregon, was led by Lloyd Reynolds and was established in 1968 modeled after the Society for Italic Handwriting in England, which was established in 1952. Alfred Fairbank promoted foundational hand and italic. 
Maury was a longtime member of that society. And Lloyd Reynolds, in fact, was designated as honorary member of the SFC in 1974. So then uh, Maury Nimoy was a member of the Society of Calligraphers from 1950 to 1956. It was an organization in LA for professional calligraphers inspired by Arnold Bank. Members included Maury and Harold Adler, Marty Oberstein, Bill Fandel. There were about 25 graphic design and lettering professionals who were members. Many of those uh, had designed movie titles. And then at the right, we have a letter um, from uh, Mr. Jacklin from the Society of Scribes and Illuminators when I became a member. This uh, society was founded in England in 1921 by former students of Edward Johnston. And um, uh, let's see. And it has both fellow members and lay members. So I became a lay member in 1974. That allowed me to get a list of classes in England from Clifford Sadler thus starting my European education with David Howells. I went to Nuston Hall in 1974 and 75, and then went to study with Wendy Gould and Anne Heckel. I got to visit uh, the Klingspor Museum and see uh, Carl Georg Herfer and Hans Schmidt and so on. I mean, it was just uh, the most amazing thing to have joined that uh, society. So I encourage those of you who are interested can also join that society. So, um, here I have the letter from Clifford Sadler uh, listing the kinds of classes that I could take. And David Hallis was my top choice because I had seen some of his work and I thought, oh boy, do I want to study with him? So here we are, David Hallis is here and here I am in my former self. Uh, the 1974 experience was uh, quite rewarding. Um, and uh, upon David's recommendation, I went immediately to, fit, to visit uh, Dr. Halby at the Klingspor Museum in the Offenbach where I examined the work of Eva Ashoff, Rudolf Koch, and others in the archives, along with amazing woven tapestries by Hans Schmidt and other great calligraphers. That was quite an eye-opener. And then when I went to study with David, uh, he handed us out these um, calligraphy models, which were also just absolutely exquisite. So this was from both 74 and 75. Um, and he just had the most beautiful flourishes and double pen lettering and so on. Um, it was just fantastic. So uh, Nancy Ochita Howells has uh, presented me with this um, wonderful um, piece of Donald's that was done, David David's that was done in 1992. And uh, a beautiful uh, close up of a rendering of um, a Royal Leicestershire Regimental Roll of Honor. So uh, this is a detail of double line letters written with a single line pen. And so uh, another beautiful piece of uh, David Howells uh, done in 1995 that Nancy sent me. Very exciting to be able to see that. And so now we're going to talk about our main actors, Donald uh, Jackson and Maury Nimoy. So uh, you know that Maury Nimoy is on the left and Donald's on the right. So Maury Nimoy taught lettering at UCLA as a regular professor from 1950 to 1956 until in its wisdom, UCLA decided to get rid of all craft oriented uh, <laughs> kinds of classes, which was ridiculous. Uh, anyway, so from 1956 through the late seventies, Maury taught calligraphy at UCLA Extension, which is where I started taking it in 1971. But he hadn't taught calligraphy uh, before. And so he um, wrote to Lloyd Reynolds and asked, um, gosh, can you have any, give me any advice? So in 1956, he received an 11 page letter from Lloyd Reynolds on how to organize a uh, calligraphy class and teach it, which is just unbelievable. Um, the SFC uh, honored, let's see, I should say in, yeah, I said that. Okay, moving on. Okay, and here's some examples of the pages that I got from Maury in 1971 and 72, uh, showing us how to do the ductus of the letter forms and so on. Ooh, I think I went back. Oh, I guess I did both. Yeah, so here's the next one, a portfolio of uh, exemplars from 1973 and 74. And so in, um, on April 9th, uh, or maybe 19th, uh, 1975, Maury was honored as the mentor for the society, and he was also celebrated again for his 70th birthday in 1982. Many articles had been written about Maury. I wrote one for the Calligraphy Inc. Uh, volume three, number three, uh, and there was another, uh, there are several others also including spring 1982 calligraph 
written by Julie Slater and Tom uh, Will Willman. And so this piece on the right is uh, one of uh, David's, excuse me, Maury's. And uh, uh, it says, calligraphy, you have stained my being. It was done in 1975 on a cotton cloth that he used to wipe his pens. Is that amazing? It's the most beautiful piece. Uh, some other artwork by Maury Nimoy. This was in the article that I wrote in 19, whatever it was. And um, uh, with beautiful artwork, the beautiful birds that he used to do and brush lettering, really a, a, just a wonderful a set of uh, images. And uh, I thought you would enjoy these wonderful pictures that uh, his daughter Salima sent to me of him in his early years when he was working for Columbia Pictures and others doing album covers and so on, um, sitting at his desk with his Ben-Hur right at his, uh, at his face there. And these wonderful, these album covers are really just too wonderful. <laughs> so I've enjoyed those so much. There are a bunch of others too that are just great that I couldn't show. And the Abominable Snowman and Cool Hand Luke, movie titles, very exciting things that uh, some of us didn't always know about uh, the kind of work that Maury was doing professionally because he was really truly a very modest man. And so um, Salima, his daughter was lucky enough to study calligraphy with her father and help him as an apprentice in his mechanical layout work. And so she, I, I'm very uh, pleased to um, talk to her in just a moment. So in 1975, the SFC honored Maury Nimoy with the title mentor, since he imparted to so many of the founding members his ardent love of calligraphy. We are so pleased to have author, storyteller, and journalist Salima Nimoy, Maury's daughter, here to talk about her calligraphic experiences with her father, about her father's professional work, and how he loved the friendship and camaraderie of fellow calligraphers. So I'm going to take you back to Salima. Thank you very much. I'm Looking forward to see, hearing what you have to say. Salima. I'm looking, oh, there you are, dear. Let me, let me spotlight you and unmute yourself, Salima, because we will hear you better. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. And Good thank morning. you so much for um, this wonderful experience. Just to go back through all the images that you gave uh, us last night to look at, Kitty, just bless my heart so much to see all of that. Um, for those of you who may have gotten a Christmas card from my parents or um, met me at some point, you may be wondering which daughter of Maureen Nimoy is, is Salima. Well, I'm the same one you may have known as Carol. Uh, Salima is my middle name. And when I became a writer in the 1970s, uh, when I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area, I began using that name. So I wanted to share um, a very special time in my life, which was in 1971 when I had the opportunity to take uh, calligraphy classes with my father at UCLA Extension. Um, he would pick me up every Wednesday night, I think it was, and we would go to Ship's Coffee Shop in Westwood, and then we would go to UCLA. But as most of you know, my dad was so humble and uh, he did not want anyone to think he was playing favorites. So I was asked by him to tape up my last name on the, my briefcase so no one knew I was a Nimoy. And then um, when he would go, as you recall in class, he would go down the aisle and look at everybody's work and he never said bad. He always said could use improvement, you know, just always encouraging. And he would always skip me. So, um, you know, eventually they figured it out who I was and, and it was just wonderful. We used those um, portfolio that uh, Kitty showed you and I absolutely loved learning it. I loved learning it from him and he was more than happy to provide me with every tool that I could possibly ever need, pens, ink, drafting table, paper, all of it. Um, he very much encouraged my, my work in that. Um, and then afterwards, um, in 1972, he invited me to uh, become his apprentice at Columbia Pictures, where he was um, art director in residence, they called it, I guess. Um, he would do movie titles, advertising, trailers, um, and things like that. And so he taught me how to do paste up and um, 
use a T-square single edge razor blade, which of course, like all good artists, I cut off part of my finger with. And um, paste, paint the around the film of the that I pasted on the blackboards, paint that black so it didn't make a, a, a line when it was shot on the screen. This is all ancient history to anyone who's using a computer, but at the time that was about as advanced as it got. And um, he did um, titles for movies that you may or may not have seen like Butterflies Are Free, Bob Carroll, Ted and Alice, uh, Cactus Flower, um, the movie Buck and the Preacher. And the Ben-Hur um, image that Kitty showed you, he did. He was invited to do an entire storyboard on the movie Ben-Hur, which was all done by hand painting. My dad was also a wonderful painter. He did the whole storyboard, but in the process of having been asked and presenting the storyboard, they gave the job to someone else. So it's not his work that appears on that, but he was, uh, he did do the title work on The Greatest Story Ever Told. And if you, if you know my dad, probably if some old movie comes up, you can tell it's his work because most of it he did by hand. Um, so that was, that was wonderful that I got to work with him and learn from him and um, see how he interacted with the people that he worked with there. Um, he also did uh, over 100 record album covers for Capitol Records. He did private commissions for the Getty family um, and for President Kennedy. And in 1977, he was awarded a Daytime Emmy Award for the title sequence of a movie called Siegfeld. Um, so he was quite well honored for his work, but uh, his name doesn't appear on very many of the things that he did because they didn't give credit either. They didn't give credit in those days for title sequence or he was working for someone else as is most of his most famous work. No one knows he did it. So, but that wasn't really his, that wasn't really what made him the most happy. The most happy thing he did was to do his work. Um, in 1984, um, he was asked by the Macmillan Publishing Company to produce a how to do calligraphy book and to include that same teaching portfolio that Kitty showed you into this book so that people could use it as a how to book. Um, they didn't want it in type. They wanted the book handwritten out in calligraphy. And so he asked me to help him write the text and then he was gonna do the production. But in November of that year, um, my father died suddenly um, at 72 years old. And eventually I was able to fulfill that project on his behalf with another calligrapher, uh, Terry Englehart of the Friends of Calligraphy in Northern California. And so we produced, uh, you, which you saw the picture of that book, um, the study of, of letter forms calligraphic. And in it, we were, I was able to include a tribute to him. Um, as far as how well my father was known or what he did, everybody knows he was so humble and generous. I uh, just a quick funny story is one time someone invited me to go to Sedona, Arizona and took me to see the chapel of the Holy Cross. And I noticed there was a display case in the front with an explanation about the chapel written in calligraphy. And I thought that was pretty fascinating. So I went to look at it and I read the whole thing and I got to the end and it was done by my father. So that was, that was pretty exciting. And with that, I just want to say this, that um, the children of famous fathers rarely are ever aware of who their fathers or their mothers are in the eyes of experiences of the world. But I was very fortunate to both work and study with my father. So I did get a beautiful glimpse of how others saw him. And the class parties that were held at our house from the UCLA extension classes. And I think there may have even been a society meeting there held once or twice. They were just a delight to him and my mother, Margie, um, who was his partner in life and everything else. And six weeks after my father passed away, my mother went to join him. As everyone knows who met my father, he was very soft-spoken and very generous. 
And if you met him once, he put your name on a Christmas card list, which you got a Christmas card like the ones that Kitty showed you. You got a Christmas card for the rest of your life. Um, there was over a thousand people on that card before he passed away. And I made it my work, my mission after he and my mom passed to send a card to every one of those people uh, about them. I got hundreds of replies from people I don't even know. And they all said the same thing. Your father changed my life. Excuse me. <laughs> and this is the legacy that meant so much to him. You and the society are that legacy. It wasn't the stuff he did on the movies or whatever. It was his students and his colleagues and the people that he shared with. And I just want to thank you on behalf of him, my mother, and our whole family for all the love that you gave him. That love was his most valuable resource. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. That's so wonderful. So wonderful to hear from you and, and everything that, you know, we knew him. Some people were lucky enough to know him in the classroom. Some people uh, through the society or different things. He sat behind me at retreat one year <laughs> and, um, and he wrote in my book, um, there is only one Janet Martorello for which we are grateful. I, it wasn't for whom we're grateful, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I never asked him about it. Thank you so much for that. Now, Thank I don't you. see any questions in the chat, um, but you can put questions in the chat and we will be able to respond, but there are none there now. And so thank you so much. And I think um, rather than going back to principles, is Donald in the room? Nancy, I see that you have a, uh, is Donald in the room? Thank you. Sent Thank you, Donald, love. the note. He is not on. I sent him a note asking if he's having problems. Okay. But, um, he is not here. All I'm right. When he's anyway. Sorry. I'm going to go forward anyway, and then okay. go on to the next section. I'll just keep on going until he comes. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So uh, again, just to remind everybody, because some people have just been arriving now, we're going to keep you muted. But if you want to ask a question anywhere along the way, go ahead and put it in chat and uh, we'll be able to see it. And we'll be able to ask that question for you at some point along the way. So that's great. Okay. And then um, and we will be going to other people to and we'll spotlight them as best we can to, so that you can see people and hear them. Thank you so much. Okay, Kitty. Okay, so can everyone see this? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm moving on to the next slide. Salima, thank you so much for doing that. It just brings back so many memories as this whole meeting is all about. So that was very heartwarming and um, delightful. And I'm so glad that you were able to do that. So I'm gonna be talking about Donald now. If he, if he can't come in until we're, um, uh, if he can't come in at the proper time, then I'll just keep on going. And then uh, Janet will let me know when he's here. So he's coming all the way from England, as you know, and his granddaughter is helping him uh, get this to happen. So uh, we assume that this will, um, that he'll be with us very shortly. Um, I got this lovely uh, picture of uh, Donald Jackson and uh, Irene Wellington from Marita uh, Klosterman Sheeran. Um, and I just want you to realize that we are part of a very long process of learning calligraphy from the greats. So starting out with Edward Johnston, who taught Irene Wellington, who taught Donald Jackson, who taught all of us. Think about the all of us that that would encompass. That's an awful lot of people that uh, all of these people have influenced over these many years. Donald Jackson, of course, is our honorary member. Uh, and I'm going to start by uh, telling you about what he did here in Los Angeles and in San Francisco. Um, starting in 1973. So Donald Jackson offered two workshops on calligraphy and illumination at Santa Cruz summer extension workshops in June and July of 1973. Phyllis Caven took a one week course and then the three week course was attended by 32 students including Pat Topping, Chuck Badinis and Larry Brady. A lecture was squeezed in between the workshops of which about 130 people attended that. 
Donald strongly encouraged the uh, participants to form a calligraphy organization, which lit a bonfire of enthusiasm in both San Francisco and Los Angeles. So over here on the right is a beautiful alphabet that Donald did with gum uh, ammoniac uh, in 1975 that I was able to uh, get. And so um, Donald Jackson, of course, is very well known uh, for the St. John's Bible, but of course he has an awful lot of work um, in his long career. But what's exciting about this uh, project was that he was able to hire other calligraphers um, to help him with the many multi-volume uh, Bible. Um, so uh, again, his, um, his efforts to include everybody are just uh, you know, phenomenal. Now he gave a lecture at uh, LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and a workshop at the Norton Simon Museum, which were quickly organized by Phyllis Caven and Mel Caven for August 14th, 1973. They pulled out all of the stops and got support from the Graphic Arts Council at LACPA, Dawson's Bookshop, Catercraft's binder, Bookbinders, their own business, Zaitlin and Van Brugge Booksellers, and Maury Calligraph, that lovely invitation to the right um, to the, all of the events. Now the room at LACMA was completely filled with standing room only in the aisles for at least 200 people. It was electric. At the end of his lecture, Donald made two legal pads available for people to sign up for meeting again with the newly made calligraphy friends. That was a valuable addition to Maury's long list of students that he had taught for more than 20 years. Donald said, that was the night that the SFC found itself as a community. Now, Donald returned to Los Angeles in um, 1974, July 7 to 25, to teach a three-week course in calligraphy and illumination at Mount St. Mary's Doheny campus. The attendees included Chuck Medinis, Marsha Brady, David Meckelberg, Echimura, Marian, sorry, Miriam Halperin and me, among many others here. I'm hoping that crowdsourcing will help us identify the many people that I haven't yet identified in that picture. So he taught for three weeks uh, at UC Santa Cruz later in the summer. So what we were, uh, class participants were um, required to copy a page from an original manuscript uh, for which he provided a number of books in that 1974 class at Mount St. Mary's Doheny campus. And so here's the page that I did uh, from the second Bible of Charles the Bald with uh, raised gold on vellum. Very exciting. There. So um, Donald returned to Mount St. Mary's College Salon campus from um, in 1975 and um, participants included, oh goodness, there are a lot of them. <laughs> Janet Weber, Nancy Ochita Howells, Jerry Beebe, Homer Edwards, Marita Sheeran, Chuck Medinis and so on. You can see that we are still missing identifications of some of the people. So if you can send us a note, that would be uh, lovely. We can fill this in. And Kitty, yes, I believe send us a note means to send it to Christy. Is this correct? Uh, I will have to um, find out from Christy where people would send corrections. Uh, you know, possibly it would be useful to put it in the chat, and then maybe at the very end, Christy can explain where people can um, give more corrections and amendments. Maybe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kitty. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, so here's Marita Sharon's uh, page from this, also from the second Bible of Charles the Bald in her 1975 class with Donald, also raised gold on vellum. Um, and I think I told you already it was on the Shalone campus. Now, uh, Donald loved it so much in LA that he returned in 1976 and 77 to spend a whole year with students at Cal State LA. Chuck Medinis was his right-hand man. I was corrected that he didn't actually host him. He hosted him for the Mount St. Mary's events. Chuck Medinis took all of his classes, by the way. Um, and the participants are listed down at the bottom there. If you ever want to, you'll be able to get this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation on the SFC website eventually. But let me just mention a few of the people, uh, Janet Martorello, Ken Jackson, Nancy Ochita Howells. Um, and so, uh, let me see if there's something else I wanted to say. Okay, and Chuck Medinis took this a year long class and this is what he did in that class. Uh, you know, major, a major piece. 
And Marita Sheeran also took the year-long class with Donald in 1976 and 77. And this is um, the work that she did in that class. And um, she also provided instructional sheets from the 1976-77 class on cutting a quill by Donald Jackson, where he showed the steps one to six above and seven, 10 to the right. So that was lovely that she was able to provide that for us. And Janet Martorello's work that she did in Jackson's uh, year long class uh, is there to the right, also with raised gold. You know, so hard to photograph showing the raised gold. Either you get blinded or you don't get to see the gold. Thank you, Janet, for sending that to me. So Thank you. we are delighted that Donald Jackson is able to join us. We hope if he doesn't, I'll keep on going. Uh, for this history of the founding of the Society for Calligraphy. Donald has long been the scribe to Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth, Crown Office at the House of Lords. And in 2016, he was awarded an extraordinary honor, Papal Knighthood, Knight of St. Gregory the Great at Westminster Cathedral on June 15th, 2016. But in 1974, the SFC pre presented Donald with the title Honorary Member which we like to think is the most cherished honor he has ever received. So this is when I would go back to uh, Donald. Um, can you tell me please um, if he is here? No, and he hasn't replied to my email. So there must be some sort of technical difficulty. Okay, so um, you, I will go ahead and um, talk about all of the other people who uh, were influenced by Maury and Donald Jackson. Kitty, yes. at some point we want uh, participants, those who, of us who were with Donald to be able to speak about the experience. Yes, um, do you want to do that now or you want to wait until Donald comes? Good question. Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead because I think when he comes, you all will want to be able to say things. If he doesn't come, we'll go back <laughs> to that. Okay. Or, or, or without him here. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. All right. Um, I'm just going to try to get through my part and then give the rest to Donald if he can manage to get in. And if he can't, we'll have okay. um, on the next session when I break, um, Janet, I'll, uh, you'll guys yes. talk about those experiences, please. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Okay. So um, now we are talking about, you might notice that I have kind of a movie metaphor on this outline. <laughs> so we have the coaches and trainers who might've trained the actors in the, uh, this play or this movie. Um, and so these were the people that were surely influenced by Maury and Donald. There's a long list here. Um, and uh, I'd like to say too, that uh, Marsha and Larry are so uh, unhappy that they weren't able to come here today, um, but they wanted to give you their best wishes and to also um, say how wonderful it was that we started the Society for Calligraphy and that they were proud to have taken part in that uh, or those early days as well as the continuing days of the society. So I'm, let's see, uh, here's a huge list of classes that were done in 1976. And I'm going to just tell you a little bit about these classes. So Larry Brady started teaching calligraphy at Cerritos College. Let me just go back to the picture of Larry so you can see him. So Larry Brady started teaching calligraphy at Cerritos College after Donald's class in 1973, where he already taught graphic design and lettering. That was also in response to his experience with studying with Donald Jackson. Larry had taken Maury Nimoy's class back in 1965 and Marsha Brady took it in 1967. Marsha started teaching calligraphy at Long Beach in 1975. And then I started teaching calligraphy at Cerritos College where Larry was from 1976 to 80. And then when Maury stopped teaching at UCLA Extension, I took over in 1979 to 1983 when I was in graduate school. Um, so I took the workshop with uh, the one that was sponsored by SSI with David Howells in summer of 74, as you saw before, and uh, again in 1975. But this led to Marsha and Larry Brady bringing him and Sheila Waters, dear Sheila Waters, to Cerita, Cerita's College to give lectures and workshops in 1979. And that's where Nancy Ochita met David Howells, marrying him five years later. Larry arranged an, uh, exhibitions and poster artworks in uh, 1976. And Ye and Reese was the first calligrapher that Marsh and Larry brought to Cerritos in 1977. And they brought him back again in 1978. 
David Mekelberg was teaching at uh, La Casa de Maria, uh, a week-long program in 1975. Nancy Ochita is giving private instruction. There's an article about her in the LA Times, April 1st, 1975, and so on. David Green is teaching small groups in Altadena and LA Valley College. Bonnie Barrett at LA Valley College and El Camino Adult School. Janet Martorello is giving private instruction. Homer Edwards is teaching for the city of San Gabriel. Maybe I'll get you these, this list again. And Eric Ray and Ronnie Friedman were teaching at Temple, Temple Beth Am, um, and Immaculate Heart College. Morris Zavzovsky at Cal State Northridge and Michael Hugh at Laverne College. That was just absolutely amazing that by 1976, there were all of these people giving lessons. And David Beckelberg <laughs> put out this wonderful flyer. Could you hand use a little class? Yes, of course it could. So now I'm going to talk about the supporting cast, those people who were involved in 1973 in trying to figure out how we were going to become a, a society. And so basically it started uh, after, um, uh, after um, Pat Topping and Chuck Medinis came back from studying with Donald and he had exhorted everyone there to start a group. So they came back and um, Maura Nimoy was teaching at UCLA, of course, and they were in his classes. And so we were, uh, I started there in 71 and we were always talking about the organizations that he belonged to and shouldn't we have an organization. But by the time they came back, it was very um, clear that we needed to start something. Miriam Halperin offered her house. And so um, that's how we were able to uh, start a group. So uh, we announced a preliminary meeting in November Maury write out an invitation to the first gathering. Let's see if I have that. Oh, let's see. Well, here's our first gathering. Um, and um, armed with new lists of interested calligraphy enthusiasts from uh, Donald's magical lecture in 1973, plus Maury's long list of students. So the first exploratory meeting was held at Miriam's house. And let me just show you again that Maury here is opening the uh, champagne for us at the party. Um, and he's just really happy to do that. So the first meeting was um, at uh, Miriam's house on November 2, 1973. Lloyd Reynolds came down for that. So you'll see Lloyd Reynolds here um, in these two pictures on the right, talking with Miriam Halperin. There were at least 60 people who attended for the potluck. And slides were shown by Maury Nimoy, Pat Topping, and Eric Ray. And Pat talked, uh, talked about joining the SSI as a lay member right at that meeting. And then we also, uh, she also made, oh, here's Marsha Brady talking to Maury. And uh, I'm celebrating here with Miriam and uh, Margie Nimoy. So um, Pat also called for volunteers for a steering committee, which we called the Ad Hoc Committee. And so that's probably what I have as the next slide. So the uh, ad hoc was committee was organized and the first meeting was set for December 7th, 1973. We continued meeting until uh, April of 1973 after which we had the annual general meeting to vote in our board. So- hey, Kitty, do you know who wrote that out? What wrote who's, that out? Who's writing that is? That's mine. It's horrible. <laughs> It's mine. That's why I wouldn't want Dreadful. to. Dreadful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but this is Pat's, I think. Um, so the ad hoc committee meeting started meeting on December 7th, as I said, and met January 11th, February 2, 10, and April 21. So here she's asking uh, people um, at, on the ad hoc committee um, to look at this questionnaire and um, see if you can give us some direction for that very first meeting. So here are the ad hoc committee meeting minutes, which Janet uh, Martorello just provided me because Nancy Campbell had given Deanne the archives. So um, it's a long, long way to get this, but I'm so glad to see them again so that I could uh, see more exactly what we did at the meetings. And so each ad hoc committee meeting member was to bring ideas about the foundation of a calligraphy group and its purpose to that January 11th meeting. So this was in December 10th that to Nancy Campbell had written out uh, thoughts from her group. You know, I'm reading a lot of this because I know that some of you might be on an iPhone or other kind of device that can't read all of this. So, but you will be able to see this uh, later on on the SFC website. 
So Chuck Medinis, Maureen Nimoy, Harvey Rosenberg, and Marion Halperin were tasked with writing the by bylaws, which were then thoroughly discussed and amended by the committee. The document to the right eventually became uh, five pages long. So the ad hoc committee formulated the mission statement below. So I'm gonna read that apropos for what we're, we're st it's still our mission. The purpose of the society shall be to promote the study and critical practice of calligraphy as a craft and as an art form, to encourage individual excellence and to foster a wider appreciation and deeper understanding of calligraphy, its history and applications by the free interchange of ideas and techniques. So um, actually I'm going to read you a few more things that the board did or the uh, ad hoc committee did um, uh, at those meetings. We had to discuss what kind of activities that we wanted for the future um, and suggestions of what kind of committees that we wanted. We had to develop a board with a slate of officers to be voted on at the annual general meeting. Um, the board meeting and dates were to be announced ahead of time so that members could attend the meetings. We requested that Pat Topping design the logo that you saw on our first page and to bring in information about the Society of Scribes and Illuminators. And um, we discussed whether or not we wanted a newsletter or, or a journal. Um, and we wanted to emphasize the promotion of excellence in teaching and the importance of primary sources for study. The committee uh, in, I think February 2nd, voted to change the name of the committee to the Interim Board of Governors. And then there was a discussion of nonprofit status. So now we go to the meeting on February 2nd, 1974, which was really the actual birth of the SFC called To Be or Not To Be. So here's Maury Nimoy's writing, um, inviting everyone to become a charter member of the Society for Calligraphy. So we convened on February 2nd uh, at the Museum of Science and Industry and voted to accept the bylaws, which had been mailed to prospective members and thus began the very first official meeting of the Society for Calligraphy. And uh, so we attracted a lot of uh, charter members. <laughs> so here's the list of the charter members that we were able to have by July 4th, which was just a few, what, two months, three months later, who became charter members by July 4th. And now um, let's return to the panel where we can have everyone on the panel discuss their experiences with Donald and uh, since it's uh, apparent he might not be able to come, so we'll discuss that. And also to discuss that, that period of time in 1973, early 74, the momentous founding of the Society for Calligraphy. So I'm gonna go back to the uh, screen chair and uh, Janet will be moderating the panel. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. So uh, that was one, it, it is continuing to be and Kitty has done so much work for this, as you can possibly see. Of course, it looks all very simple now, but thank you so much. Uh, so we'll we'll get back to Kitty. I think there's two things so that have been brought up. One is um, Donald's class, and one is the beginnings of the of the time. So perhaps we should start with uh, the most recent, which is if any of you were there for the beginning and the ad hoc committees and how it was all forming. Um, Nancy Campbell, for instance, you were part of that, were you not? You want to unmute, honey. Nancy, unmute. OK. OK. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Thank you. I sound like a Verizon ad. <laughs> uh, we all do. OK. Yes, I was on the ad hoc committee. There were 13 members on that ad hoc committee. And the board members um, that were uh, elected right after we got started were 12. So I was sort of like hanging out on the edges. Um, I did lots of different things. and. Uh, it was a fantastic experience. I love hearing all this talked about again. I, I'm remembering every minute of it, as a matter of fact. I took Maury's class in 73 and um, everything just kept going from there. It made a whole new life for me. Is this where I'm supposed to talk about retreat or is it another time? 
No, no, not now. Thank you very much, though. We'll call on you again for that. Yes, I, I was on the ad hoc committee, and it was a wonderful experience. <laughs> thank, thank you. Very exciting. Okay. <clears throat> Does anyone else here want to speak uh, to the that those very beginnings, ad hoc yeah. anything? Janet, can I speak? Yes, of course, yeah, Nancy. Right. When I first started taking calligraphy in Portland, Oregon, where I grew up, in about 1970. No, it was 65, 65. I was in, at, uh, with, with Jackie Savarin and, and Lloyd Reynolds and all. We had no calligraphy books. We had no photocopy machines, no handouts. Everything was just done on, on a blackboard and then they would come around and, and help you. It was, a, it was really a barren sort of world. And when you try to find out where people were meeting, there just weren't hardly any any societies about anywhere. And so to have this sort of spark, and I wasn't quite sure how, how that spark started. Maybe it was the advent of the computer and people felt like they wanted to write and maintain good quality handwriting, or at least to be involved as a human being, to be more alive with your writing. So when we saw the beginnings of this fantastic organization. There was so much excitement. It was really unbelievable. You'd walk into a room and Miriam Halpern would give you a big hug like a mama. And I was so sad when uh, her neighbors complained about her meeting there at her home because it was zoned resi uh, residential. And they actually stopped us meeting there. Mm -hmm. And it was quite difficult to find uh, regular meeting spaces. Uh, to just give you one example, if I may, uh, I sent out the word that we were looking for a place to meet uh, when I was on the board. And uh, we arrived at F uh, Fairfax High School and the auditorium was full of half-eaten sandwiches, paper, paper crisps, bags of food all up and down the aisles. And there was no janitor there. I mean, it was just absolutely, it was a total mess. And to ask the members to, to sit in this environment was so embarrassing. Well, Chuck McDennis was with us, and I think he was a colonel or something, a high-ranking official. <laughs> yes, yes. And we did find a, a janitor. And he said, oh, I'm going home in 15 minutes. I mean, you, you, you people deal with this. And this gentle man, quietly spoken, rose up on his shoulders, and he became a high-ranking military official. And he says... Soldier, help them get this mess cleaned up. And the man just went, jumped, <laughs> and he became instantaneously helpful, which I, I, I couldn't believe the trans, transformation. But everybody worked together, and there was so much sort of joy in just making things happen and sharing the love of calligraphy. And we didn't even have the word calligraphy in those days. It was called lettering. And when you signed up at, at the, uh, uh, what you call an adult education class. So we've come a long ways. I mean, I, I'm so grateful because calligraphy changed my life. I mean, I would have never dreamt about marrying an Englishman and going to England. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I just want to thank all the people, especially Kitty and uh, Larry and Marsha Brady for bringing David to America. And to say, uh, really, it's, it's totally expanded and, and transformed my life into a happier and better person. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. I remember how important you were to everybody, and and uh, your house and your and you had that little um, place to buy things. You had your little store that eventually Helen Gershon uh, provided us when you went to England. So uh, you were you you've been so important all along the way. I want to re remind um, people who are not part of the panel that if you type your questions into the chat, then we can uh, take care of you there. Okay, we'll read those. Um, anybody else who wants to talk about the very beginnings and the ad hoc committee and that kind of thing that we're around? Is there anyone else who wants to speak to that? And Salima, do you remember any of that going on? And Janet, Bruce has raised his hand. Oh, good. Oh, there he is. Yes, okay. So I had called on Salima. Do you remember any of that? And then we'll go to Bruce. You have to unmute Salima.
Right, yeah. I'll go to Bruce uh, and then I'll come back. <laughs> um, to... <laughs> oh, there you are. Oh. Okay, thank you, Annie. <laughs> um, I left, I moved from Los Angeles to uh, Oakland, San Francisco Bay Area in 1973. So I was not here for the beginnings of that, although my dad would always tell me what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I was very blessed to go with him to the 1974 Manuka. Um, retreat where I met Lloyd Reynolds and well I probably had met him before but where I met Bill Gunderson and Lloyd and became lifelong friends with Lloyd of uh, sending pen pal letters back and forth to him until he left the planet so I that's that's the extent of which my uh, experience with the beginnings of the society are sorry okay well thank I you very much and, and thank you, Salima. And then we are going to go to Bruce and spotlight him. And Bruce, right. thank you, hon. I, I just wanted to follow on to what Nancy Ho had to say in terms of the extraordinary life changes that, that our activity with, that, that calligraphy has brought into my life as well. Nancy expressed it so beautifully, but I wanted to reinforce that feeling. I, I come into it through through um, 1958, studying at Reed College and meeting Lloyd and studying lettering with him, which was revolutionary. And then uh, I escaped into South America and went to different places and wound up back in LA and met Maury, which was a godsend. It was like, oh. And at that time, um, this was at the beginning when things were forming and I was, I was there, but I kept slipping through the crack and coming back and uh, I was unable, I was trying to raise two daughters and, and get a, uh, a design studio and a print shop off the ground at the same time. So I was unable, believe it or not, to do any of the proper study with either Donald or Maury. But through the connection with the society, contributed in, in whichever way I could and just fell in love with the group and with the the whole spark that turned into a conflagration uh and little thing out of sequence but going to london and and going to to heels department store and there in heels is a place called cranks it's a oh. coffee, coffee shop nancy you'll know it right yeah it's cranks and heels was like the center of the universe for me for about three weeks it was a little it was a little restaurant that was everything was handmade way before its time. The pottery was hand thrown. Everything there was British craftsmen. And the menu blew my mind. And if I'm not mistaken, Donald Jackson did the menu in his exquisite little hand, sort of based on, on Edward Johnston's round hand, but uh, with a more modern humanistic feel. I could have eaten the menu and then sustained. <laughs> Fabulous. Anyway. Um, I have a pot holder from there. <laughs> do you? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> I wish I'd had the presence of mind to steal one myself. Well, there you are. No, I did not. No, I purchased. I purchased, Bruce. <laughs> I'll step out now because I, I will be talking a little bit later about the calligraph when we get into the news. Yes, yes. Thank you. We will see you again. All right. Thank you so much. And um, I think now it's time to invite um, perhaps Marita uh, to start with from the... Um, our class that was uh, 76 to 77, do you wanna talk about that at all? I will, um, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, but I did want to say to Salima, um, you, your father changed my life. I'm, I'm in that, that large category too. And look, looking for certain memorabilia, memorabilia over the past week, I found my report card from him, from his class in 1973 with a big, a and you know i'm sure he gave everyone an a uh, um, <laughs> um and i found <laughs> my little certificate that i did at the end of the session that he signed he gave us a format to create a certificate for ourselves and then he would sign it at the end um and i still have that i still um and they mean uh, um they are treasures they are they are uh, uh treasures indeed um and I, the other comment I wanted to make about Donald passing around those legal pads um, 
so everyone could sign their names and addresses to to form a community is that I, I remember him saying, you know, everybody came to this meeting thinking they were the only one in love with calligraphy. And then they uh, arrived in this room and were amazed that they had found their own tribe. It was, um, um, it really was uh, such a time of, of bonding. And um, also about the technology, do you remember people in these classes, we kept our tools in fishing tackle boxes. That is what everyone said, go out and buy a fishing tackle box to put, to put, to keep your tools to come to class in. So um, it was um, such an early time, but you can see behind me, I have the, um, the demonstration um, sheets that Donald did. This was, uh, this is the way that uh, other way that instructors would um, to, would show classes. This is before you know, obviously before overhead cams that we that we use now. So this is Donald's um, quill cutting um, steps one through ten, and. Um, I had them packed away for 40 years um, and brought them out again. So I thought I would share um, them with you. So you could see the size and how, um, in addition to the blackboards, um, these dem demonstration sheets were created. And um, lots of times, if you asked really nicely, uh, the instructors would share them with you, which is, which is how I obtain them. So, you can see, um, so, so now, I, and I still have some quills that I still need to cut. So I still, <laughs> I will be using this. So um, thanks for letting me add um, those little bits into the history. I remember all those steps. I still cut quills sometimes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Marita. Okay, and- um, oh, Can I mention that Donald jo is joining our meeting now? Oh, excellent, excellent. So um, is he here, at, is he full, fully in? Uh, he may be, well, I'll scroll down. Okay, um, I was one of the people in the year long class and I have to say that um, I, I thought I only, I thought I joined the, the society uh, just a, a few months after it formed. I think I was actually uh, a, um, a year or two later, but um, I one of I was teaching a um, a class in calligraphy, and this was a private adult school, um, and uh, they normally had not more than six people in the classes, and I had ten, so they were just over the moon about you know the enrollment, ten people, and it was one of those students who had seen an article in the L.A. Times and said, Janet, this. Donald Jackson, scribe to the Queen of England, he's going to be talking yeah, yeah, and yeah. up at Mount St. Mary. So it was like, wow, I, you know, <laughs> uh, that was, that was so super, it was exciting. So I, I got myself up there. This was in 1975. And, um, and it was, I, I went to that, I went to that meeting, he showed some slides, he showed a movie, and the movie was uh, of him taking an egg yolk and breaking it and having it go down into this little pan and um, I, I'll spotlight myself just for a second and having it go go into the little thing and then he took the stick of of uh, vermilion and I still have some sticks and did this in it to, to grind it into the egg so then he could write with it and I I know I sat there in the in the dark. We were sh sh seeing this movie. We were in a theater, and um, I started to cry. I I, I honestly, it was so amazing. And I said to myself, I don't even. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, you know, I didn't know people did that kind of thing today. Uh, and and I I don't know where I had ever seen anything like that before. I don't know why those words came into my, my mind, but it was like, I, I just, wow. And he had already taught the 1975 uh, class at Mount St. Mary's. And so I determined that, um, 
the next summer I was going to be in his class and um, it was going to cost, it was a hundred dollars for the class for a week. And I just determined that I was going to absolutely save up little bit by little bit until I got that hundred dollars to be able to be in the class in summer of 76. And then um, he taught that year long at, uh, at Cal State LA, they weren't the universities yet. And Donald, I'm so glad you're here because we get to hear from you about the whole thing. And um, he was my second teacher. I mean, in, in that summer class, he said to me, we had to show our work and, and we had a little consultation. And he said, I, I thought I was a middle of the road calligrapher. And he looked at my work and he said, so you're a beginner then. <laughs> but this man knows, so I, I had to accept what he said. And um, yeah, I'm still I'm still a beginner. So um, anyway, it was so exciting and to take that year long class. And he didn't teach us his letters. We had to learn from manuscripts. We, we, uh, we got to a place where we had to copy this thing from 1105 and the Ramsey Abbey Psalter and and we kept working on it, working on it. How, ta how tall is this? What pen angle is that? Something, something, something. Until our work all looked as much the same as it could. And this was really the format and Donald about how, he's, how he got a group together for the St. John's Bible, the kind of the same process. I think he experimented with us and always put out that dream of um, someday I'd like to write the Bible. And, uh, you know, the, it, he had all these dreams and... Um, and I remember saying to him, Donald, I, I just want to write perfect letters. And he said, oh, I don't. I want to write letters with life, lively letters. So anyway, silly. Um, so Donald, I'm going to unspotlight you and find you. Please start talking. And there you are. Okay. So let me, let me spotlight you so that everyone can, uh, can see you. And I don't know how to do that now, but okay. Would you please, please share with us? <laughs> There's so much, Hi, and Donald, everybody. we've allotted a half an hour for you, so please. Um, is this, I mean, are we on now for everybody? I'm sorry, I'm a bit yes. late. Uh, no, no, uh, we're I'm a, so a happy Zoom, here. I'm a Zoom virgin, and I <laughs> uh, almost entirely, but anyway, it's lovely to see you. I can see, uh, you know, um, a selection of you all um, um, and I just say hi are we on with the whole session now or yeah, no, uh, yeah every, is already signed on? everyone can see you you're spotlighted for everyone to see you so this and, is not um, a rehearsal this is the real thing this is the real thing oh, okay. <laughs> rehearsal right. well, hello everybody <laughs> I'm sorry uh, I am here yeah so yes. um I just was hearing, um, you know, I, I hope, I hope that any of you are still students out there, like Janet, who said she still is, and I count myself as one of them, by the way, but if every, anybody who could repeat what I've taught them all those years ago, like, she, that's got to be a good student anyway, if you're going to be a student, better be a good one, um, but anyway, um, it's good to be here on it. I'm still just finding my feet and worrying a bit about which buttons to press. But we, you know, I'm here, and um, it looks like you can see me. I suppose. Yes. And hear me. Good. Um, so I, I am supposed to be talking about the big where I my path met. You, the path that you were already on. Presumably. Yes, how you yeah. how you came Just, to, to California, the whole how you got here. Well, yes, I will indeed. Things. Well, and, I will because you the, uh, meeting up with um, Angelinos and meeting up with the students of Mori and others. I that was nowhere on my horizon. I mean, I had no idea what I was going to find because I had never been to the West Coast before. Had cut my teeth on borrowing the fare from my dad. I was 30 years old in 1969. And I, uh, I bought an extension fare ticket to New York and took a bundle of work with me 
basically to see if I could sell it and to see what interest there was in what kind of thing I like to do. Um, and so I sort of had an, a, a sort of two or three, well, years of to and froing, meeting up with the people in New York, the sort of community that you have in the major cities in the US, I suppose, in Los Angeles, you had, uh, you know, expert lettering artists, some from Europe, some from, you know, homegrown, and uh, um, with the basis of a lot of their income was spill off from the movie industry and uh, those things like that. In New York, it was advertising. So you had calligraphers there, you had calligraphers in LA, but I wasn't to know all of that, but I did know something. I'd sort of cut my teeth, uh, as I say, with um, meeting other in people in the States who were interested in calligraphy. And the similar kind of thing was about to happen, but I didn't know it in on the West Coast, because what would happen is people who were working in their own individual studios, professionals, and also some students and people who'd picked up the vibe that this was something interesting to do, came out of the woodwork when you had a visitor like me arrive, who had this title of being the Queen's calligrapher or Queen's scribe. And so people would come out of curiosity and um, not knowing really what I did. So it wasn't me as a person or the quality of what work I was making. But when they did arrive, uh, coming to see what this person did, who was an official scribe, etc., they found out actually I was talking about something new in their most of their eyes, which was calligraphy as an art form, calligraphy playing with it, and so on and so forth. And so, um, uh, th so this guy, um, young kids at school, their teacher has a year um, exchange program. Uh, in a school in Palo Alto. And when he comes home, I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I've been working actually this summer at an extension course at UC Santa Cruz. Um, they'd be interested in the kind of thing you do. And so I wrote a note thinking, well, I, uh, you know, they, it seems like a good gig if I can do it and take the kids and, and Mabel and I and the two kids. And it turned out, that they were interested. They tried it, they hadn't done it before. So they put out an announcement. This is the extension program for the summer. Well, of course they, they were very good at that. So it went everywhere. So what happened was people just piled in. Now that wasn't, again, it wasn't me as an individual. It was just a general interest that was already had been fostered in different parts, similar to the kind of sort of um, buzz that was uh, coming out amongst your generation and um, around Murray and as I said others and I always came to meet them I did come to meet them and so uh, it was entirely an accident I mean just speaking to the to my sort of nine and seven year old children's uh, school teacher and ended up there the only thing was they signed up so many people that they were calling me and say, can we take, I said, 25 people max. And then they said, well, could we have another and another? Because basically they hadn't seen that many people coming, waving money at them for so, you know, a long time in the summer. I didn't know that what the dynamic of all this was, but when it turned out, they signed up 32 people. And I said, not another. And on the morning I walked into the classroom, the classroom was a, they just closed, it closed, well, it was, a summer, it was a summer holiday, of course. So the, the, the library, it was arranged there. It's a very modern, beautiful campus. Some of you know it. And arranged in the library was sort of like an auditorium. So we all just made it into a studio for 32 people, except on that morning, sitting on one side was a, a, a woman who had, it turned out flown down from Alaska to say, they said, no, we've closed the course. They said, well, he, and she said, he'll surely squeeze one more in. And she'd flown down on, you know, on the off chance that she would get in. Uh, and this is it. I'm afraid you, 
I hope you don't think of me as being a ruthless person, but that morning I was ruthless. When I was looking at 32 people and one more person was the straw and I said, I'm very sorry, you can't. And it was again, uh, already interested. No, um, but I wasn't prepared for it. I mean, I had given workshops for, I mean, first of all, I taught in college, uh, as in an art college in London. And, you know, it was a tutorial, I mean, maybe, 10 people, you know, for a day a week and then evenings. It was very, I had never dealt with anything of that size and it was a challenge. I also wasn't well equipped. I had only a small, well, a bunch of slides. That was about it as far as the AV was concerned. In those days, there were no books that people could have been studying in advance very much. It, it's very difficult. It was a very black and white world in terms of print. Um, am I talking too much and too long here? Oh, no, absolutely but, not. Um, you so have anyway, at least but, another 20 minutes. Thank you. That thank you. a long time. I may stop in the, in the middle and then come back. <laughs> I'll ask you so questions. Don't the, worry. Um, the, the people who were there were amazing variety of people. You had people from um, f had come down uh, via, um, uh, obviously, uh, Portland, Oregon, where, where, where Lloyd Reynolds had, you know, uh, quite a, well, a huge um, group of ex-students who he had, in, you know, he'd been the waver of the banner of italic uh, in handwriting and every day, just in order to lift the quality of the life of so many people, just when you pick up, a, we are spoiled because we get letters which are all handwritten and beautiful the postman always stops and stares. He was doing that. I'm, I went up there eventually, just a little story about Lloyd Reynolds. And we stopped at a gas station to fill up. And the little sign on the gas, on one of the you know, little place of note was stuck on there in beautiful Italian, very, uh, very, very Lloyd Reynolds style tank, I have to say. And the gal who was filling the, the tank, um, he said, ah, oh, that's very nice handwriting. And she was dungarees, you know, she was a blue collar worker. And she wasn't a college. Um, he said, what college did you go to? She said, I didn't go to college. This is my job. And he said, who did that handwriting? She said, I did. And that, no, you see, that was the real fruition of his attitude was that everybody who could, you know, um, ought to. And, and, that, and then it raises up the quality of everybody's experience, her experience writing it, us reading it. And, and that night, especially, it was a particularly poignant. Um, but he wasn't that keen on his students branching out, as it were, diluting their, as it were, zeal. Um, for italic by coming to do gold leaf. And uh, apparently this, uh, the, um, the brochure that was sent out um, uh, was written by a, a, just one of the a, a young guy in the uh, a student worker in the office at, at Santa Cruz. And he had calligraphed on it the announcement, come and meet the queen, you know, the queen scribe and so on. And, and Lloyd Reynolds said, uh, something to the effect that, well, if he wrote that, it's not worth going to. Don't do oh. it, you know. <laughs> uh, um, and, he, and, you know and, he, and so they eventually sent one person down as a sort of um, um, one of the teachers to, to, to learn as much as she could and then go back and do it. So anyway, I arrived there, there's her. And then you've got people from New York. You've got uh, Harold Yardland who had a studio there with, um, uh, probably, I think, 20 calligraphers working there, you know, an old style, 100 year old business, actually, um, that he'd inherited from uh, where he, uh, um, a place when he returned from World War II in Europe. And um, so, and he brought his head calligrapher and his wife and um, then there were people from the middle, the rank, there were people from the Bay Area and then obviously from the LA area. And I could name names, but once I start, I get tied up. 
um, <laughs> with that. So, so what I'm saying is, it was exciting, and um, the the sheer, shall we say, novelty of it all. All that many people, the power of the people themselves who were there, and my, as it were, uh, inexperience to some extent. So, um, okay. Um, uh, uh, and it wasn't all all praised. I can tell you that I got I got one letter after that first week. It was supposed to be how to teach italic or do italic. I can't remember. And then the three week course was about eliminating techniques and quills and lettering and so on. And that first week, I had a letter from the husband of one of the uh, students who said, "My wife took a week away." from her, whatever, vacation, to come and learn about how to do italic. And all you did was make them play with pens. They were automatic pens uh, kind of thing. And, and you made them make their own letters and you made them invent their own. She came to learn, not to be, you know, so and I had a really, it was a totally misunderstood. On the other hand, Tom Ingmar was in that one week class and uh, he went back home and the first thing he did was sign up for anything else that came along, you know, I mean, so <laughs> we had the two different attitudes and in between, we had this energy that came out uh, and uh, built, start building up and uh, Phyllis Cavin from, from LA um, was in that first week's workshop and others, there was a, there was a contingent from um, uh, which I don't know if it included Maury at that point, I don't think it did. Um, certainly, um, uh, uh, Mr. Adler, and um, I think maybe Pat Topping. I have Pat so, Topping and Larry Brady and Chuck Medinis. Uh, they were in the class, but the, there was some. There was also a little group that came to just visit, you know, uh, whilst it was going on. And oh. um, thank you. Yeah, and uh, so I'm trying to bring myself back to just just to, to just the panic. This was all going on in Santa Cruz, but what it was doing was building in me a realization of the need, of the of the hunger really, of companionship and sharing and, and learning that from each other how great it was to be in the same room with other people who didn't look, you know, didn't weren't looking at you as if you had two heads, was some, what somebody said to me, you know, when you start talking about calligraphy. And um, and Harold and at one point we came to the stage where I was demonstrating gold leaf. This is just one point, and I'll move on. I'll move south. And um, <laughs> Harold, I had a, a, a burnisher made out of hematite that I had to make myself. And but I'd been taught by uh, an old arts and crafts, uh, you know, master. Uh, who worked with a guy called Grady Hewitt, who was the gilding master in you know the 20s, 30s. And I only had two burnishes. I had one delicate one and one broad one. And I was teaching and I had 30 students. I mean, forgive me, I'm just, it's awful. But I, you know, work all those years on the Bible, these things come into your mind. It was like loaves and fishes. I had you know, only a few, two burnishers, 30 people. And the following day, everyone was going to be coming in to do gilding. So it was going to be difficult, put it that way. Some people had hematite ones, but they didn't have this, not hematite, they had... Um, um, agate? Agate ones, thank you. I all the help I can get, by the way, please jump in. <laughs> no problem. And so, um, uh, Harold, Yardland disappeared the, the later in the afternoon. And what he did, he he just went, got a cab from Santa Cruz, drove to San Francisco before five o'clock, and he found an antique shop that had a big chunk of hematite in it. Not only was it hematite, it was the right kind of hematite that you needed for what I, you know, the purposes. He got that rock, that, bought it, I don't know, he paid a lot of money for it because it was just an object, you know, uh, 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 not, it wasn't there because it was hematite, it was an object. He bought it, 
And on his way back, there was a rock shop on the right side of the road, uh, which he knew, which he noticed on the way up. And he stopped, knocked on the door, the shop was closed, he got the guy out. He's a really brusque New Yorker, big fat cigar kind of talking guy. And he persuaded that man to cut that piece of hematite into 32 pieces, slices. And he got some doweling, wood doweling, and between them, and they were working until the small hours of the morning, sticking bits of hematite onto pieces of wood with super glue type glue. And that morning he walked into the workshop with a burnisher for every single person. I think he said it was nine, 9.97 or something like that, it did cost him. And I said, how on earth did you manage to do that? And he just turned to me and said, Donald, in his New York, you know, I'll go, he said, Donald, there's nothing that an American Express card cannot do. Nothing about Harold. That was his, his, that was his answer. And he just, it was there. He'd saved my bacon. And so um, that was the spirit of it. And we used to, uh, that. So, so that, in the meantime, after that first week, Phyllis and her husband and others that were already amongst, you know, in that group, all um, with, and again, uh, Mori was absolute star in this. He, um, he produced a flyer. It went all around the LA graphic arts community and the money was found to rent the, uh, rent the um, uh, County Art Museum. And then they sort of said, well, would I do it? Would I come and give a talk? And I, well, as again, I wasn't very prepared for it, but anyway, down after the, the whole exhausting month of intense teaching and excitement and um, Friends for Life actually made that. Um, came down, uh, a guy who, uh, he took Morgan and Kate, my uh, two kids, and he said, look, I'm taking them down to Laguna Beach. They're gonna see what it's like to be in Southern California. He had, he was in his seventies, beat all the other students at uh, table tennis all throughout the course. He'd been there for three weeks. He'd worked in the, in the, in the, um, in the movie industry all his life. Uh, and I'm, and I've got to say, I'm blanking on his name at the moment. Uh, he put the two kids in his pink Cadillac with fins and not, you know, what is it? Um, what do you call it? It's no roof. And um, convertible. And, yeah. And then convertible. And they just drove off waving to our, his, their parents. And off they went for several days down to Laguna Beach with the student and um, had the time of their lives. And I'm pretty sure that they joined us in time for that talk at um, the, at the um, County Art Museum. The other thing was a, a day's workshop at the Norton Simon. And that was when I first met Maury and a number of the other people from, you know, the sort of in the community there. That particular night um, dropped something. Ah, excuse me. Right. I'll just I'll say, that. Donald, that people are still very excited. They want to know about the hematite. They want to know everything. So, you know, they want you on oh, here right. for okay. another five hours. Yeah, yeah, that's an, that's but an but we'll talk we'll talk after Kitty leaves because we have to um, you know, be cognizant of everything she's put together. Yeah. But we still I'm want you. To... We still we still have I'll, another I'll 15 minutes like. for you. No, 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 no. We have another. I just want to tell you while you were picking something up that had dropped, that people are just very excited still, you know. Uh, you, you still have all these people who are who are so much um, wanting to know. We're, we're, you you told us in class that we were like little birds with our mouths constantly open, wanting to be fed, and yeah. <laughs> and that's still true. <laughs> yeah. Well, so please go on. You have another fifteen yeah. minutes, no problem. Well, thank you. But um, I, yeah, but I, I really want to get down to that special night because it was special for me. It was special for is it this whole thing where the power of um, of all moving in the same direction, you know, and all at the same time and feeling that strength. I mean, um, 
what I'm saying with, with that Santa Cruz experience prepared me for that night. Because just as jumping forwards, working at Cal, uh, Cal State, um, Mount me, which for the year long workshop, which ended up with these evening, basically three hour sessions once a week in the evening for 10 weeks for a semester, that showed me how you could extend that, what was supposedly ideal um, situation, well, which starts in a teaching uh, um, context, with, where the student walks into the room and the ideal thing they think would be the most ideal possible is that you sit to one side of them, they sit to one side of you, and you're with them for the whole week. You know, it's one-on-one. -on -one. You know, they have your undivided attention. And of course, you have, that's the teacher's job. In my case, what I found was, no, start it and everybody ideally is works sideways and uses the knowledge of everybody else either side of the room. Other than me, I, I guide it, I lead it, I encourage it, get people in clusters, get the energy shared, pay visits to each cluster. And that made me realize uh, after the Cal State LA experience of uh, 80 odd people signed up for those lecture classes in, a, in the auditorium. And at the end of the semester, we had over a hundred would creep, but most of those didn't pay. They'd crept in the extras, but they were coming with friends. And that, that group meant that the energy, that, you know, instead of, I mean, you know, turning out to do a, a, an evening class after a day's work, you know, for three hours that you could easily say, oh, I'm only one of 80. You know, they'll never notice. But if you were one of eight or six, because they were all in groups, then you would be letting the side down. People turn up and they group. And so I learned that in LA, but going back to it, started in, in Santa Cruz, then coming down to LA to this talk this evening. And this sitting there, and I will stop in a moment. Mabel and I went there, we can't now remember it's amazing, isn't it, how little, I mean, not everybody's like Janet, they can remember everything. I, um, we, we just couldn't decide whether the kids were there or not. I thought they were. And we, was, we walked up to the back of that auditorium and looked down at the stage. And he thought, this, and I said, this is going to be embarrassing. This is such a big place. You know, where are the people going to come from? And when I went down and I said, well, at least I can just sit on the edge and, you know, talk to, a, you know, small group at the front and when the doors opened people just kept coming and coming and coming and those of you who are there uh, will remember and uh, <laughs> right <laughs> that's true and so I just picked up and I also did truly and this is where I think uh, having just come from this I was high as a kite coming from Santa Cruz so coming to the U, I, I just was really open to picking up on what was going on. And that's why I sensed that all these people were looking. In fact, I said that night um, as a closing part of it. And, um, and again, I was just, I had very few slides of mine. I think I had six slides of my work. I had a quite, uh, I had got a number of other people, other European calligraphers work and which I showed and I said, I'm sure this is the first time ever in the history of the US. Sorry, this is beginning to sound a bit like a certain other person who's been living in Washington these last three years. Um, it, it, that um, this many people has been in the same room to talk about calligraphy or Italic, I probably said. It, so, you know, I've got a feeling it might be a good idea if you get together again. And, so I asked for two people. I think Chuck probably one was my sort of right hand guy and then somebody else. And they took legal pads up the two aisles. And as we were, I was chatting and we were drawing to a close, people were signing up their names 
on these legal pads. And at the end of it, I think there was something like 80, 80 sets of names out of that crowd um, signed up. And that was, an, that was your mailing list. Um, you had others obviously, but that was one which said, we'd like to get together officially as a group so that we can share what we know and what we don't know with each other. And um, the, uh, there was something I skipped over, but it's, it's quite all right. Um, but that was, you, that was, and then I can remember thinking, well, that's over to you. And, oh, I know what it was because it was rooted to in that sense of it's all right for me. I just pop up and I, you know, do my thing and then away I go. Uh, but where do you go next? And I didn't know about the, of the, the, the hinterland of classes and that have been going on in LA, but I do know that up in Santa Cruz, people are saying, well, where do we go to keep, you know, to go from here? And I said, well, you, you've got to help yourselves. And the way you do it is you, you share. And so that, that concept of, well, the only thing at the moment is the society described as illuminators in the UK, let us, you tell us what's going on in your neck of the woods. We will put a column in our, in our newsletter, which actually I call the American page. And that went on there and that told you what was going on. In other words, because, because it was such a big country and, and it was amazing then how people, so it, I, I'd already been sort of, it had been instilled in me this need and a possibility of how it might be resolved temporarily join the SSI one and then on the ground spread out that information and so that's how it happened but the readiness the keenness um was already there thank you so much and it's still there it's still there donald <laughs> you're so important to us um i'm hoping can you hang with uh and until later because sure. what's going to happen is that we are um kitty's going to be going through her things she needs to leave at 10 till uh no, no, please. 10 it's, to I'm noon and and, and um, oh thank you because people are so that. hungry well, people are well, we're still <laughs> hungry we still have our mouths open oh, and, right. um, we're referring to my supper which is time which is oh because i'm uh, different <laughs> well you can't time difference you, you i know yeah. i know i, I so appreciate uh, Nancy, this of course is on the same one Yes, yes, you're eight hours ahead of Pacific time. So yeah. for those who don't okay. um, necessarily so, know. So um, I'm doing my, uh, my uh, greatest granddad um, <laughs> teacup, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, what's what's gonna happen is um, is Kitty's gonna has much more to present. And we're so glad you're here. And, and then, um, after she leaves at 10 till the out next hour, um, we're gonna we're still gonna be here and talking and, and we can we can be here until half, you know, for another hour. People don't have to leave at noon. And so it uh will and people are asking lots of questions and they would just love to hear from you again. In the interest of the program, we have to move on, but but please stay with us. And um, I'm so I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Donald, so much. Great to see you. Okay, so um, I think perhaps Kitty, we should move on with the program. Is that good for you? Oh my gosh. Uh, no, we should stay with Donald the rest of the time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> really? I mean, that, Donald, you did just exactly what I was hoping you would do, which was to talk about, you know, the, the very earliest moments that you got to California and um, how, when you came down here, there was this explosion of activity because of your lecture. So that's what I talked about uh, before you were able to get online. And uh, so the other part of the my little presentation is just to talk about the aftermath of your lecture, uh, us forming an ad hoc committee. And um, before you came, we actually voted to start the SFC in my little presentation. So I'm just going to uh, try to get a little bit faster on my presentation so that um, we can get back to you if at all possible. So I'm just going to- Well, uh, he'll hang on. and we're gonna stay longer than, than you, Kitty. I know you're yeah. leaving at 10 to 12. I know, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to stay to open. Zoom. Yeah. Oh, I know, it's so exciting because you have your, your, uh, your, your, uh, 
I'm sorry, exhibit. now I'm losing words. <laughs> you have your exhibit going on and the link is on the on the website to how to go to see your exhibit virtually. So that's exciting and, and we know so much. And and then uh, we'll hang and Donald said he'll hang. And so we can we can hear from him some more because it is exciting. And and then uh, and we can chat and say hi and we can keep this open. It's not a problem. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kitty. Carry on. <laughs> okay, so uh, Donald, we have now formed the Society for Calligraphy on February 2nd, 1974. And um, what we had to do is to figure out, okay, now that we formed it, um, what are we going to do? So we had to set up an AGM, an annual general meeting, so that we could vote in our um, new officers and board. So, but back to uh, February 1974, we had to do some research. And so, um, because I had presented at the very beginning of my talk, the organizations that existed before we started, um, that uh, Maury Nimoy, Pat Topping and I went up to Manuka Retreat in Oregon to um, get advice and encouragement from Lloyd Reynolds and other calligraphers there, uh, Jackie Svaran, Inga Dubé, and Bill Gunderson, and newly minted calligrapher Tim Gervin, who was quite amazing. Um, and Salima was there, as you can see on the left-hand side. And um, we made a report to uh, the organization in March on this research that we had done. Uh, meanwhile, uh, just here's a picture of Maury at the... Um, Manuka with the names of all the people who had uh, advi who had been at that uh, retreat, which was really for contemplation and, and practice. And here you can see that uh, we have weathergrams that Lloyd Reynolds had started um, so that you would draw your, you make up a poem, a haiku poem and write it on some um, little piece of paper and hang it from the trees and let it weather. It was really very uh, moving to be able to do that. So now we had our first get acquainted meeting on March 29th, which is where we gave the report on the um, Manuka retreat. Uh, and uh, there were slides from a 1965 calligraphic exhibition at Cal State Northridge, which I don't remember who was in that one. So if someone could write us a note and maybe tell us more about that exhibition, that would be pretty exciting. So Donald, we're asking people to keep on amending this uh, so that we get a fuller picture of the very early years of the society. And so here's our denouement that we actually had our general meeting uh, with Lloyd Reynolds who came down from Portland for us and um, that we had the presentation of the board and a vote on the officer slate so that you can see the slate of boards on these years, 1974, 75, Chuck Medinis and Pat Tommy were the co-chairman, um, uh, and then Pat was the chairman on 75-76. I was chairman 76-77, Phyllis 77-78, and Nancy Otita Howell 78-79, and so on. Um, and so that's what we voted on at the annual general meeting. And uh, these are the officers, I guess, uh, that we typed up, someone typed up in 1985, and I made a small correction. And then we made a list of potential committees and request for volunteer members, including getting a journal editor or a newsletter editor, whatever we decided to do, and an exhibit coordinator. So um, this was a list from 1976, but it still tells you about the number of committees that we had, communications, exhibit, telephone tree. Uh, that was pretty interesting, <laughs> no email, <laughs> and uh, program chair and uh, refreshments because we brought our own and membership uh, person, a librarian, a special projects, activities, and photography. So um, we had a lot of people involving themselves in the um, organization. So here was the inauguration of the Calligraphic Inc. Inc. newsletter. This happens to be issue uh, three of volume number one. Uh, so we would announce the lectures and evenings um, with people um, that we had organized. We also, uh, oh, I showed you this one. You oh, went backwards. I, I press, I'm going backwards. Okay, sorry. Why are we going backwards? Here, now we're going forwards. So I just wanted to say that Dan, Dan uh, Ed, Alan Cameron was the artist who, uh, uh, he also was the uh, developer of the newsletter. 
he was just a wonderful artist and he enlivened these newsletters, which were usually just 11 by 17 folded sheets with extra pages inserted for special activities. And here's a, sometimes they would put, um, uh, Alan would put artwork by members in the um, Calligraph Inc. And so here's David Meckelberg's lively calligraphy highlighted in this issue. And he wrote out several copies of this beautiful poem, one of which found its way into my collection. And then in 1978, a new publication was proposed. This is the editor's note to discuss whether or not we want to have a new publication for a journal in addition to the Calligraphy Inc. Uh, newsletter. And then this is a, an example of the calligraph from fall 1983, volume six, number one, with a fold out cover of Irene Wellington's calligraphy. And Bruce Bishop was the calligraph editor at this time. And he's going to be talking uh, about that effort. So right now, we, I was going to return to the panel to discuss the impact of the newsletter and uh, new journal and the experience of serving on the board as an officer or committee member. So we're going to return to the panel. OK, great. Thank you, Kitty. And so uh, Bruce Bishop, I'm going to be looking for you right now. Um, I'm looking, oh, there you are. Thank you. So we'll, I was going to spotlight you and um, allow you to talk about the change in uh, what was going on with the, what, what you did for us. With, oh, <laughs> sorry. I've got my, my buttons wrong. All right. No problem. Thank you. So briefly, uh, I had started out. Oops. Sorry, I've, I've lost Bruce. I'm looking for Bruce. Is he there? I think his internet dropped out. I'm sure he'll log right okay. back. Okay, we'll invite him back again when we uh, have that. Uh, Kitty, do you want uh, anybody else to talk about being on the board yes, early I, I on? Nancy, Nancy Ochita Howells to talk about her time as chairman. Okay, let me find her. Oh, there she is. She's out of the room at the moment. Nancy? Okay, then I can talk to her about chair. <laughs> she, okay, she didn't know that she was going to be called on, I think, so. Maybe not at this moment, yeah. Um, uh -huh. So just, uh, uh, I don't know what to say because I'm not prepared for that one. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but anyway, by the time uh, it got to me, we had you know over 200 members. I can't remember how many, but uh, uh, the highest amount that we had at some point was probably about 1,400 members. I don't know, uh, it may, Christy says it's maybe about 600 members now. Um, but at, you know, with any organization, all of the um, officers and board members are volunteers. And so they spend their time doing as much as they can, but you always need more people than um, are really available to you. So sometimes as the organization gets older and older, uh, people don't uh, apply themselves to the organization, the duty to the organization as they might. And so I just ask the, those of you that uh, want to do something for the organization, um, that that is in the bylaws that as a member, it's your duty to help the organization. So that's all I wanted to say. So if Nancy is- Well, and, de and delight, you know, Kitty, can I just speak that um, that when when we had the, and we were not to it, I think next to the, um, when we had the uh, the first exhibit, it, it's always that the the idea is that you are, you are supporting the love of commonly of the whole thing that we that we um you know our passion part of it is the responsibility to to be there and and you know make it better I, nancy's entered the room again so we'll we'll get call on her in a second she doesn't know we're going to do this um you know and to keep supporting and i have to say that after taking donald's year-long class i felt and still feel the responsibility to to um, disseminate as much as I can with knowledge. And so I teach for Santa Monica College Emeritus Program, and I have 60 people right now because we're, we're virtual. I have people from San Diego to Berkeley. It's so wonderful. And, um, you know, we're able to do this as we weren't before. So um, Bruce Bishop has entered, is entering. But meanwhile, um, Nancy, we're asking that you um, talk about being on the board to begin with and, and how that was. 
just a brief thing about you need to unmute yourself though sweetheart yeah about being the chair about being oh, the yeah. chair on the yeah well i thought that in a way we, we had great enthusiasm but we didn't have a lot of the basic things established for being a a, a business oh am i am I, can you hear me yes we can thank you and so what happened was that i spent a lot of time just getting a place and i I wrote and I telephoned people and said, is there a hall or a meeting room or an assembly room, uh, a cafeteria, any place that we can meet that's going to be safe? Because there are a lot of areas in LA that I would not wish to park my car. And finally, I got a phone call from Roy Fong, the father of Ed Fong. And he said, come and see the Department of Power and Water in downtown LA. And that was like, utopia for us that was wonderful because we found a meeting place that was clean warm and safe for free and we must have used that for how many years have we been using that when a did lot <laughs> many we, we many used that for maybe 35 years <laughs> and, i mean that's that is incredibly amazing and another aspect is that I wanted us to get our, our accounting, our books sorted out. So the tax people, and you know how tax forms, I mean, you don't get excited filling out tax forms. And I thought, this is like, this is like pain. This is torture. But every time I would have to wait in a queue or going shopping or wait in a car park, I took out my, my nonprofit status papers for the state of California and the IRS, and you had to get it approved by everybody. And two years later, we were granted nonprofit status, which means that we don't have to pay tax on our membership fees or our workshop fees. And getting certain things like that sorted out so that when we start, we're building on a strong basis and not just, you know, oh, who knows what the accounts are? How much money do we have? But, you know, all these questions that come up. And just so that we have a structure that can support the society that would last for years and years, no matter what our size. And we grew, we grew so big. I mean, I think in my term, we grew from about 500 to 900. And so we thought, look, there's people who don't have cars. So we set up this telephone network and transportation network. And we made a map with all the members on the map to see where they were located. And from there, we thought, I was very concerned because if you have members living so far apart as in Los Angeles, the society could split up into small groups. And I wanted the mother society to be strong. So with, I thought to myself, if we have a mother society that can organize the main program and then we send to other areas, calligraphers, workshops, speakers, that we could have a kind of a save money and use the energy of a, of a calligrapher who comes Friday night, they can talk in LA, teach a workshop Saturday and Sunday. Then in the midweek, they could go to another area and that following weekend to another area. And that worked out so well because airfares were getting expensive. And in those days we were debating on whether to pay a calligrapher a hundred dollars, which, which, which is not very much, but in those days, I noticed that on the Nesson Hall, the tuition for one week's course was 12 pounds. Anyway, we wanted to make the tuitions accessible for as many people as possible, and it worked. I don't Thank know, you, it... Nancy. Thank you so much. Um, Kitty, I'm gonna ask you, should we um, carry on so that you can get through everything and then talk to Bruce and people no. afterwards? Is that Bruce a better now. plan? Bruce now. Bruce now. Okay, so Bruce, we lost you, as you know, know. Uh, when we you were, were just starting friends. to talk. So let me let me spotlight you, love, and you can talk to us about how the um, about how <laughs> what your part in all of bringing our our calligraph and things to light. Great. I apologize for the technical hitch. Um, <laughs> that said, basically, what happened for me is I had started a design studio, uh, doing a lot of calligraphy, but other kinds of uh, of design, logo work in particular for small businesses. Uh, and uh, because I was having difficulty getting things printed to my specification, uh, a fellow I used for printing advised me that 
there was a big print shop that was getting rid of a, of a small press that was filthy, but really a good press. So I wound up buying it with money that came in out of the blue from a debt that I had written off that someone had repaid. I'd been to England and the money came in. I lent a guy a lot of money and, and well, a lot, it was 500 bucks. When he came back, it came back in an, an envelope without a return address. And suddenly I had $500 and the, this big print shop that was selling their press, guess what they were charging? $500. <laughs> so for $500, I bought a printing press and then I hired a printer to teach me how to print. And we off and running then with a, with a printing firm. So that after that, I could print according to my specifications when people came in with a logo or lettering they wanted done. This put me in a, in a privileged position because uh, as I was working with, the, with the, the business, I began to develop a lot of connections in the industry. And I met and, and uh, made friends with people who would, could uh, produce uh, embossing stamps and uh, all these special processes that cutting back now to the, to the Society for Calligraphy, I wanted to go on the board specifically to be able to upgrade our, our newsletter into a proper journal and have it done really beautifully. And I could call in all of these um, favors that I had done with people in the industry so that we could do hot foil stamping, for example. So one of the, one of the covers had, had gold, gold stamp on it. And that was done for free. Uh, and another one, I think you, sh you showed the one, the article on Irene Wellington that, that Nancy had done with the beautiful fold out. So this, this paper, I believe it was Wally Dawes gave us or, or gave us very cheaply the paper. Uh, Samper, who had a fabulous silkscreen shop, hand silkscreened all 1400 covers on Fabriano for this particular edition. So taking position on the board with the, with the proviso that I could do the publication and upgrade it was incredibly satisfying. I, I, I learned a lot about editing and I learned even more about designing. And because of this privileged position being in the industry, I could call in these favors and get a lot of really nice work done at very low cost or none. So that was, that was fabulous. And just one thing I want to say before we leave the subject is that I want to give a shout out to Anne McKay, who was a, a member of the society. She was not a calligrapher. She was a lover of calligraphy. And she owned a really large, very successful printing shop called Kemp Printing. And she printed all of the calligraphs that I designed. And probably many more after I left to move to Spain for free. She did the photos, she did the, the stripping, she did the plating and she did the printing before it went out for bindery to another, to easy bindery. And her name should be written in gold um, in the sky. Uh, Anne Camp, wonderful human being. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you so much. Right um, so we are telling people that um, we're going to hang after Kitty leaves. Kitty's leaving at 10 till and we're going to hang and Donald can talk some more and uh, Nancy, people are asking about you and we can just hang for a while. So please don't rush off if you don't have to. It's Bruce, please be here too because you're so important to us. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you, Kitty. Um, Perhaps we move on to the next piece. Okie doke. So um, so uh, just wanted to mention briefly the uh, kinds of programs that we had from 1974 to 1975 once we were uh, an official organization. So you can see my list to the left. We had a special workshop for the Routes and Coffin Club. Uh, and a potluck for Donald Jackson, 
Um, and going to the Doheny Manuscript Library was extremely rewarding. Paper making with Twin, Twin Rocker was fabulous. Ward Ritchie's lecture, Georgiana, Georgiana Greenwood's lecture, the retreat, which Nancy Campbell will talk about shortly, um, and then our AGM for 1975 and the Grand Tour to London. So I'm just going to talk briefly about um, one or two uh, small areas of those programs. One is that the Ransom Coffin Club is a printing society and the program there was really unusual um, that uh, SFC members offered to demonstrate calligraphy to attendees. These are printers on July 13th, 1974 after viewing an exhibit of calligraphy. So um, that was pretty amazing that it wasn't you know, your usual kind of lecture um, and uh, these were the people that organized that. Uh, and that uh, Larry Brady organized this and there were specific suggestions for instructing the members of the club in small groups uh, coordinated by Larry Brady. And they were asked to uh, take a felt tip pen, draw the letters by tracing and then draw them without tracing and so on. I mean, it was just really wonderful. We should keep on doing that, take, take our skills to various clubs who don't know anything about calligraphy and give them this kind of a program. It was really pretty wonderful. And then just to say for Donald, you know, when he came down in 1974 to give that uh, three week workshop that I was lucky to, uh, to take in the afternoons because um, I was teaching in the mornings. Um, <laughs> so he, uh, we gave him a nice party on July 21st. Uh, and then Nancy Campbell will talk a little bit more about the retreat, but just to say that we had done our homework so that we could have a retreat of our own, which we uh, formed at La Casa de Maria in um, Montecito. And uh, this first one was organized by Marcia and Larry Brady. And uh, Lloyd Reynolds was scheduled to lead the group, but unfortunately he couldn't come. And Georgiana Greenwood so sweetly uh, agreed to um, uh, take over for him. And I made these ceramic uh, pendants with the friendship symbol to wear. Remember the friendship symbol was there on the, um, lower left-hand corner. And so Harry Doherty wore his as his eye patch and this wonderful drawing on the upper right-hand side with me doing calligraphy and Harry with his patch. And I don't know who else is depicted there, but uh, you know, we just had wonderful people uh, putting out these um, flyers. Uh, demonstrations were given by Maury and Miriam and me and Ted Clausen and Larry Brady. And Pat Topping at that time designed and presented a certificate to Maury Nimoy, naming him not only a life member, but as mentor. And uh, she silk screened a custom SFC sweatshirt with a mentor on it for Maury. Now this grand tour to London really came about because I had become a member of SSI. I had gone to um, England to study with uh, David Howells and uh, then came back and well, before I went to see, study with David, I was with Donald. And so uh, I, we had a committee uh, on the um, board to talk about taking a calligraphic tour to England. And so I was tasked with, I think maybe I even suggested it that we take a group to England. And so uh, I was lucky enough to meet with Donald uh, Jackson and Clifford Sadler in the summer of 75 to organize this three week uh, extravaganza from August 8th to 28th uh, with teachers, uh, Anne Hecklin, Wendy Gould. Now this was sponsored by UC Santa Cruz because Donald already had a connection with them. And 32 calligraphers attended, in, including me, and of course my sister Meg Marriott, which was wonderful, and Marsha and Larry and Pat Topping and Nancy Ochita Howells and Tim Gervin and a whole lot of other people. Um, the first week was led by Clifford Sadler who planned a day in Oxford, one in Cambridge, one in London, and the participants saw unbelievable treasures. Among them, the one that I remember the most was an entire book written by Origi on vellum, which was unbelievably spectacular because you know normally we just see his, his workbooks. Uh, and so um, that was, that knocked me over. Uh, Anne Heckel and Wendy Gould were the instructors. The main assignment the next two weeks was to develop on a design or to develop a design on a grid incorporating several elements, calligraphy, raised gold, natural plant elements, all to be on vellum. And I'll show you my effort on the next page, but just on the right-hand side here is uh, some of the notes that we were making as we were developing this calligraphy workshop, what we thought we were going to do. And so here was the piece that I did for the London workshop. And so uh, we're gonna quickly return to the panel because uh, 
maybe Nancy could talk about the calligraphic tour. Maybe I could talk about it. And uh, also I want Nancy Campbell to um, discuss the, um, her experience uh, 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 with retreats because I think she is one of the unique people that always um, has gone to the retreats. So I'm stopping my share and I hope that we're going to go first to Nancy Campbell. All right, let's go to Nancy Campbell then. And I have to say, Nancy, you need to unmute. Um, I have to say that I didn't get uh, what the retreat was about. I didn't go until like year five or something. But once I went uh, and and found out what found out how amazingly wonderful it was, I I somewhat joke, but not completely, that it was written into my marriage contract later. You know uh, that I got to go to retreat every year. I absolutely would not miss that. So it, it became that important to me and still is. Nancy, thank you so much. Where do I start? <laughs> when it comes to SFC, I could talk myself for probably a whole day, let alone two and a half hours. And I think I'm gonna to try to do a minute here. Retreat. <laughs> deserves many minutes but it's a it's, retreat to me has always been a magical word since i first went to the first and i did go to the first which was in 74 and I, it was my first time i ever spent with a bunch of artists in an overnight experience at la casa de maria in montecito california which is probably one of the most beautiful places in the world before the deluge and it will be that way again after because they're building it all back up again and I don't want to go into that whole story but it's anyway this this situation brought a whole new meaning to the word intimidating to me because I was a complete newbie I helped start this society but I helped it because I was in that my first class was the one where everybody started talking about forming this society so I got involved I had just been divorced and this filled my cup to the brim and still is at this many, many years later date. These people became my second family and uh, it's been very important to me as everyone knows. Anyway, I was an art major in college and I'd always made art and sometimes calligraphy. Oh, I don't think you'd call it that. And I didn't even know what the word meant. But at this retreat, I was new to calligraphy with no confidence whatsoever in any of my abilities. I was new to these people because I was just beginning to meet everybody. I didn't know any of them before. And I didn't realize I was starting this new family for the rest of my life. Anyway, I'm still there and I'm still doing it. But and it's been the high point of my life every single year. And I, in all the years we've had retreats, I missed two. Um, so that's over 40. Um, intimidated me, wouldn't even perform at art that first retreat. I went all around and met everybody and copied all of their wonderful wise sayings that they were calligraphing so beautifully into a notebook. So that notebook and my camera were what I used as tools that first weekend. And I don't, I'm not sure where the notebook is and I certainly don't have the camera or the photos, but obviously I couldn't find any and I had many that would have been wonderful to show now. But, uh, you know, when you start cleaning things out when you're getting old and you throw away all the things you wish you'd kept, but you didn't know that until the week later after you threw it away. Anyway, I just wanted to let you know that among the many, many things I did with the society, which included being treasurer for eight years and helping with things and lately doing all the San Gabriel Valley regional parties for a number of years, oh, probably over 20, um, CASA itself has remained the most sacred place in my life. It's beautiful, it's serene, the camaraderie is wonderful. It's a place to find solitude and socializing at the same time. I love all my retreat part partners and there are certain of us that have gone every year. Calligraphy is my world outside my family and work. 
My goal is to keep alive and kicking and enjoy more of these wonderful times. And I hope this organization just keeps going on forever and ever. I am so proud of what it is still to this day and so happy to have so many wonderful friends. Thank you so much, Nancy. Right <laughs> Thank you so much. You're absolutely. Um, uh, we're going to call on you next again. I was amazed at the energy that Kitty had for organizing the London trip. I mean, she, from, from Los Angeles, she's organizing things in London. And she didn't mention that when we went to places like Oxford, we saw wonderful things. We had the, uh, the paper marbling people. And these, these old gentlemen would come in with kind of boots on and it's kind of like a deep swimming tank. And, and you think, what are they doing? And they removed this cover, dropped the paint on the surface of the water and made cockerel, handmade marbled paper. It was like watching a ballet dancer. They were so graceful. And we go to another place and see, you know, wonderful things. We met Mrs. Faulkner who started a little shop on 4 March Street in London. And I went to the brush shop and I went to the goat shop and everything was wonderful, except for that it was the hottest summer in living memory. And <laughs> London does not have a single air conditioner. And every day I would show up with less and less clothes. And I thought, this is getting dangerous. And some of the students would skip class and go swimming in the uh, uh, Hyde Park. What, what's the name of that river? Uh, anyway. Oh, Serpentine? It, yeah, the Serpentine. And. <laughs> Uh, it, it was just, we went to the British Library and I remember looking at very closely a manuscript and you can see the hair follicles on the vellum and see the gold that's five, six, seven, eight hundred years old and the pigment. And you can see the actual hand making the marks on the page with a slight depression where the ink is. This rich black brown ink. And you can smell the vellum and the smell the the ink that Edward Johnston wrote with. And I just felt I wanted to steal it. It was just so wonderful to see this, this magnificent, carefully done work. It really was a, an inspiring moment. And at the end of the day, I came to live in England because I just found I enjoyed it so much. I went to buy uh, some fish and chips and I thought, aren't these people so nice? They give me newspaper to read while I'm eating these fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a lot of things to learn, you see. I mean, the world is not quite the same as everybody thinks. It was just a wonderful highlight of my life. So thank you, Kitty and Donald and all the other people who were involved. And Nancy, your Campbell, your description of the retreat was just so touching, really, really heartfelt. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. But Kitty, was there one other person you wanted us to uh, I highlight have to before? I go in five minutes. And so I'm, uh, do, do you mind if I just run back and finish the, pro the program and then I got to go? Yeah. Oh, that would be perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Sorry, everybody. I mean, you know, this should have been like eight hours of fun together. So uh, <laughs> I'm just going to talk about the, the exhibit that we had at the very end there in 1975, November 15 uh, through 30, 1975, two weeks at the Blue Whale, the Pacific Design Center. Uh, this was the um, uh, poster that uh, Larry Brady um, uh, designed and calligraphed and a bunch of volunteers um, printed it by silkscreen. Uh, and then Maury Nimoy gave a talk entitled The Individuality of Calligraphy. Uh, it, it's a little bit blurry so that later on you may not be able to read this, but you really should have this message from him about how every person's hand is so different and you celebrate that. Uh, and then matting, this is amazing to me, mat cutting workshops were held all over the town in five or six different places so that you could present your artwork properly. And then we had, um, this is Maureen Nimoy's call for participation in lectures, workshops, and demonstrations and when you could do things. And here we, that was the result of getting all of these uh, demonstrations and, and uh, lectures given over this two week period. We did a fabulous uh, job with this uh, 
with this uh, exhibit. Uh, here were the volunteers who ran the subcommittees for the exhibit. And uh, we also had slides available for purchase. We had three sets of slides. There were 142 pieces entered into the exhibit and three sets were available to buy so that you could put uh, you know, one on each set, one of your images on each set if you wanted to. Uh, and then we had an activity report at the board afterwards just to do a review of what happened. And we found that there are over 3000 people attended this exhibition during the time it was open. And we got a lot of new members and so on. Over 70% of the membership participated in the planning or the execution of the exhibition. That was just absolutely amazing. I'm not gonna actually return to the panel because I have to go on to the aftermath, which is my last section. And just to say that, of course, uh, calligraphy changed my life too. I'll talk about that at the very end. So other US calligraphy organizations soon followed. The first one was in New York City, but currently there are 98 calligraphy organizations in the US and 16 in Canada. That's just absolutely amazing. And then we had these wonderful national conferences. The first one was energized by Donald Jackson. It was in Minnesota um, and was organized by Joe White. And then think of the pro proliferation of classes on calligraphy, both edge tool, pointed tool and brush, design and decoration classes, classes on the history of calligraphy, introduction to Asian brush calligraphy, and uh, sorry, uh, and the public would be more aware of good calligraphy and advertisements on sides, uh, on signs, and specialized supply stores developed with Miriam Halperin having her wonderful store at her home, Nancy Ochita Howell supplying things, and eventually John Neal booksellers, and then the trickle down effect with art stop support stores finally supplying tools and papers for us and manufacturers started providing tool sets and calligraphy paper pads. And uh, currently SFC even has an uptick in global members because of these Zoom presentations. And calligraphers sometimes find their calligraphic soulmate. Nancy Ochita marries David Towles in 1979 and happily moves to England. So I wanted to finish with that, except to say that there's the next venue in 2024, surely we'll have some extravaganza, we'll return to the panel to discuss the longevity and value of the Society of Calligraphy today and the immense benefits of national and international calligraphy conferences. So I'm going to stop by sharing and you guys are going to talk happily amongst yourselves. And I, you know, I'm sorry that I can't stay and talk to you, but you know, everybody says calligraphy changed my life and there it is. I mean, I was a math teacher and I was able to finally in 1971, take that class with Maury. I had been playing with letter forms all my life. I had loved lettering and then to go to Maury's class and to find that there was an actual tool that you could use to make thicks and thins instead of drawing the outlines of letters and laboriously, you know, filling them in. And then to meet all the people in all the classes that I took for years and years everywhere, you know, I'm just thirsty for all of this. I'm still thirsty. I'm still learning things. I'm still enjoying the camaraderie of all of the people. I love hearing your heartfelt stories, which is the whole purpose of this um, meeting here today to remember the excitement of the early days. I'm sorry that Janet Weber couldn't be here, but she said, do you remember how exciting that was? You know, like those first 10 years. It's like, yes, I do. I remember every single moment. This has been a wonderful thing for me to be able to provide as many details as possible. Again, I hope that you'll um, somehow amend my notes and, and make it uh, a document that we can keep for forever on the society, remembering you know, our roots, uh, Maury Nimoy and Donald Jackson and Pat Topping and Chuck Medinis and Miriam Halperin, we're all the, the major players um, in uh, getting us formed. And thank you to all of the people who are still running the Society for Calligraphy and to Christy Darwick who manages this Zoom thing. It's just amazing that we have this chance to be able to talk to Donald Jackson. Oh my gosh, thank you. Mwah. Thank you, Donald, for agreeing to come do this. And thank you to everyone who is attending. Uh, you know, share this with your friends because you'll be able to see this on our website. We are recording it. And my outline will be on the website as well. It was sent to you, I guess, for this meeting. But um, uh, anyway, I'm very sorry that I have to go because I'd love to chat further with all of you. And um, uh, but I have other obligations. And um, but I'm just really, truly 
amazed and thrilled that we're still running 46 years later, really 47, and um, that uh, you all are here to, to enjoy it with me, and I am enjoying it with you. This Kitty, you are getting so much love in the chat. Everybody's saying thank you and what an inspiration. And even one of your students that was your uh, in your geometry and calculus class, <laughs> how great you were. <laughs> so you've been inspiring people for many years. You still do. You're such a consummate artist. And uh, I'm encouraging people to go see your, your virtual uh, exhibit. It's not you know, uh, it's my fine binders who have bound um, a book that I've uh, done a facsimile for. But anyway, calligraphy, as I said, changed my life. It got me, the Calligraphy Society got me into book binding because um, a fellow uh, was offering it to calligraphers, the book binding class. And then I got into printing because somebody printed something for me and I said, oh, I can do that. That's a lot easier than calligraphy. And then, so I got into letterpress <laughs> printing and then I finally had to quit my job and go back to school. So I went back to school in 1980, uh, got my MFA at UCLA, and then I got my job at Scripps College Press where I've taught for 30 years. And then I retired in 2016. That's a quickie way of talking about my life. But really, I always tell everybody that calligraphy was the absolute key element that made my life turn from math. I have to tell you, I loved math. I still love math. I, that was my goal was to, teach students to love it too, students especially that were struggling. So anyway, basically I love to teach and um, I'm gonna say goodbye now. I love all of you. <laughs> You. And I you're getting so much love. You're getting so much love. Thank you. Even my oh. dearest mentor, thank you with overflowing love. These are coming in to you. So thank oh. you so much, Kitty. Okay. Can't say it enough. All right. Bye. Enjoy. Bye. bye. Okay, so <laughs> there we are. So Kitty has left the room. Um, people have a lot of uh, questions and um, Donald has hung in for us and, and may, people want to hear more from him. People want to have a chance to say hello to each other. Uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful things. Uh, Salima, they, they want to know, uh, Salima, you're, I see you right there. Do you want to just say about your book for a second? People are asking about that. Um, the calligraphy book, no, um, um, that book was published in 1985. It was remaindered in, um, you know, no, yeah, let's see, 1985. It was remaindered not too long after it was published. And so I bought some of uh, the society bought some, um, but of course that was a really long time ago. I have seen it for sale on Amazon by third party vendors who probably bought it when it was being remaindered. So I would say if you're interested in looking for it, you could go there and see unless society has some that they want to sell. Um, and then you have, have a book that's just I have out copies, yourself. I, um, I have copies for sale. Put, put that it's in the chat Deanne. because I don't know who's talking. Please put oh, it in the Deanne. chat. Oh, oh. Okay, um, okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. great. That, yeah, always better to buy it from someone you know than a third party vendor. But um, my book is not yeah, exactly it's just, just you know, two words on, on it. Uh, go to salimanimoy.com. My book is called Since I Lost My Baby A Memoir of Temptations, Trouble, and Truth. And it was published last year. And it was actually a, a person from uh, a, call a former calligrapher who helped me with the production of it. So it's quite lovely, I think, but you can make up your own mind about what you want to, if you want to read it or not, just go to my website. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here and sharing all of that. It's a pleasure. Okay. Thank you, dear. Okay, so um, perhaps we want to go to Donald again. Would that be a good thing to do? Yes. It's getting later and later for him, so uh, <laughs> I want to be able to to highlight him and make use of his time here. Donald, we want you back again and again and again. So if you speak for a second, I can find you, and then I can highlight you. Donald, I'm looking for him. Uh, I have five pages to go. No, oh, no, only, yeah, five pages. Um, so I'm looking for Donald real quick. You don't need to. I'm on. I think I'm on. 
Can you hear me now? I can hear you, love. I want to find you so oh, I can okay. spot. Oh, oh, I just saw you. <laughs> Wait a minute. Can we go back yeah, to I page? Just, I just okay. unmuted myself. <laughs> yes, yes. No, I want to spotlight you, though. Okay. And there, I you go. Him. there you go. Oh, okay. Hello. Hello, yes, you're fine, yes, please. Right. It's, um, it, um, I mean, am I spotlighted or whatever I need to be? You are indeed. Yes, you're so the star. You. Yeah, I was thinking this whole process, and, I, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it, was brave, it was a brave thing to do, to try for, you know, for Kitty and, and, and the team behind it. It's also quite brave for us, as you actually, um, it, but... I could see he was getting used to it, you know. This could be the beginning of something else, you know. It. I mean, I know that other people are doing this. But I haven't been. Uh, just a quick word. I mean, I uh, Mabel and I have been in, um, shall we say, what's it called, self... Uh, isolation. Isolation for a year now in the UK. Wales is a little bit stricter than England on various things quite sensibly in many ways, but since in our age group, we're in that kind of, you know, vulnerable thing. And it's not been easy. And one of the things that's been, you know, you can hide under a stone for so long. I mean, you know, and be sensible and be all those things. And I have, you know, I, I, I hear people, I haven't learned a new language in this year. I haven't written a book. I haven't, uh, you know, done a, a a university course or all of those things. And I've been feeling pretty bad about myself by the time I see what other people have done with their lives uh, in similar circumstances. But talking tonight um, has um, revitalized certain things within me. Uh, and, and so I think as a principle, this has got to be working could be working for everybody and probably already is but for me uh i think this is terrific um um nerve-wracking but you know uh, um lovely to hear and see everyone in this way uh when we can't hug each other and you know and sit across a, a cafe table um but uh you know, we're talking about the, the, the workshops and things that that was one way of doing it. And also um, thinking back to those lovely, um, uh, uh, well, the whenever I sit, get um, the magazine um, and when I think back and it was terrific to see the story behind the gold blocking, thank you. I've been doing a lot of gold blocking, you know, in the last <laughs> 10 years on, on that Bible project and try and and working with printers and very exciting with you know the new technology you would have such fun bruce um because so much is possible and the, it's like me and most of us when we were the computer there they're capable of so much more than we uh you know can ever utilize but if you're with a guy who works the machine he doesn't know what you and i know about seeing he may know, but he'll spend all day trying to get rid of a hickey on a on a page when basically he's missing the red by a mile because he's looking at that. But you and I and all of us, we have that. I mean, and it's magical. It feels like God. You know, you can play God. And on that on that Saint John's Bible, just a technical aside, um, I was able to sit with the guy with the magical Mac and make it better than it was in the original, according to me. Anyway, my, so, and they couldn't argue because I did the thing in the first place. I wasn't dead 900 years, which is, you know, quite uh, refreshing in a way. Um, I mean, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be alive, but still, there's a quick thing. Somebody asked a question. This is just another. This is a sort of silly thing, but I mentioned the hematite burnishers earlier on when we didn't have one to burnish with gold leaf. And I can actually, and I, I mean, you could... You could talk technical all night and everybody goes to sleep, but just a little bit about this. Um, you know, um, the burnishing of gold on gesso is very delicate. It's a question of getting the humidity right, getting the, the gold to adhere, and then pressing it in such a way that it adheres and starts to burnish brightly. That becomes like all people who work with the crafts, 
it comes down to a sensation in the end. It is, it's, it's a touch, sense of touch. But the, the tool, there was this question asked about it, hematite, just so happens, hematite said to me, was the only thing on God's earth that when you actually um, create friction, hematite actually, instead of attracting, you know, like saran wrap, that effect where, you know, it sticks to everything you don't want it to. Well, that happens when you create fiction as well. But hematite somehow or other has a negative uh, effect. It's microscopic, but it's just enough to make it really good for being able to burnish. That's why one uses that, striated, you have to shape it. Yes, you can use other things. There was a question. I taught in Puerto Rico once a two week workshop in 1969 uh, no, 1970, and this was in my preparation for coming west. And um, one of the students, it turned out, was poor, very poor. I mean, there were some very poor, brilliant students, and he had to walk eight miles to the catch the bus. And he turned up one day with some brilliant burnishing. And I said, how did you do that? He said, I found the pebble in a stream bed. And it just kept rubbing it on silk, and then I just did it. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that's the way to do it. Don't make life too hard, but he could do it. And the dog's tooth burnisher, which is shaped like um, one I don't have. I just, this is a hematite burnisher. Um, I don't always show it. That's fine. But, Hold it up kind of near your yeah, ear and we'll yeah, see it. Yeah. There you go. So that's it. It's this it. And that's a flat one. That one was a beautiful burnisher which had a curve underneath it, which fitted, which I dropped in the bath. What was I doing with the herm uh, <laughs> a, a hematite in the bath? Well, because it's humid and you just put it in there so that it was in the bathroom. It has another shape. Nice. And then of course you've got, this is ag agate, which is, I haven't found a camera. Yeah, there we there are. There you go, yeah. Yeah, that stuff. Now that, polishes gold but it also sticks to gold so that's more difficult it's not so slippy as this one is the the um that, that guy and so there we are so it's these things were found out over time the shape of a dog's tooth is generally hematite and people say well the monks in the middle or or eat all these calligraphers in the middle ages scribes illuminators rather um were they using a dog's tooth? Well, you might, I don't know, but it could just well just be that's the shape. So I don't know, but there it is. It's a, it's a stone that's shaped, um, pentallic, copied. Uh, this is um, the, the, the art materials, calligraphy art materials specialty in New York in those days, in the beginning days, uh, it made a, a, a mold of that, my original shape, which I haven't got here. And, and simply he uses, he found out that dentists, of course, use hematite, or they use burnishers to polish, you know, make gold fillings. So he found a supplier in Germany, and they made some burnishers, which then were sold into the US, which were the copy of the model I made. So, but that was a synthetic. So, right, that's a long question, but it, it's, it's one of those things which is a maker, once you start making things and you get frustrated, then you have to peel back ways of approaching it, find out the technique to do it. And that, that's what the society has in all of those workshops that different people from all around the world. And before that, in the UK and in, in, in Europe, where the, when the arts and crafts movement started, you had people who had to dig back into the past in order to find these techniques so that we don't get, we have the means to speak from within through our hands and our heart. And sharing what we know and what we don't know is still got to be and is obviously the heart of this society and the way that, you know, you, you have organizational problems, there's grunt work to be done, there's all of that, but it's all about sharing. And tonight, you know, or tonight, sorry, today in your time, I'm seeing how well, that can still be done even more effectively in some ways. And you were talking about Nancy Achida Howells was talking earlier about the fact that, you know, and you know this in, in, in LA, the spread out 
And she saw that there was a big difficulty, but then made it into a virtue by having um, satellite societies which could, you know, get together and relate to each other. So, you know, I think things are moving in the right direction, even in these really bad times. Uh, back to history, or I'll just back, I'll just stop talking for a minute, uh, and you can curate someone else in, Janet. <laughs> Oh, we have we have lots of things. I, I believe that you had us. Um, if we touch the hematite stone, then our oil was on it, and that created a problem. But then taking silk, we were able to get it back again. We talked about that for a second. Well, yes, I think maybe not quite the right way for this talk. The whole evening to go is to start talking about technicalities of that kind. But I will tell you a funny thing, and what you must never do, uh, which did happen up in Santa Cruz was one of the students who got one of these lovely, well, one of these kind of ad hoc burnishes that was made um, overnight. Um, she thought, well, to get rid of grease, because I think she must have touched it, the end of it. Well, what you do is you breathe on it and then rub it hard on silk, and then that tends to disperse it. But um, she had some, I suppose, cigarette lighter fluid, uh, lighter fluid, we would okay. call it. Yeah. And she thought, well, that gets rid of grease. So she dipped the thing into that, which of course completely and utterly soaked it with irremovable, you know, uh, um, oil-based product. So um, that was a disaster thing. No, but yes, they need, these, this is a whole other story, but the, the principle is getting the tools to make the marks and the marks, that's why, for instance, I use quills because I love that absolute, sensual quality that tactile connection um which is like an extent all tools are like an extension of ourselves um like a hammer is basically a hand made into steel um and um and so to work with the quill is like actually making a pen out of your fingernail it's that close to you and and we've heard all i've said that many times but anyway that's it um, but the, the creativity, um, which is in us all, um, well, I, I, I tell you what touched us all, I know, was when people talked about how they got started. I got started when I, and I put a pen in a bottle of red ink when I was a small child with a pen point and that ink, as soon as I put that onto a piece of paper and made a mark, that was where it, that was it. That was it. Just that sheer touching with it, that pen, that touch, uh, which, uh, and that's what Wait a minute, I'm not, I'm losing my, I was trying to make a point, which is, that's still the case. And, and everybody has to just simply, Irene Wellington said to me how I was so desperately unhappy because I lived in, like all of us, when it, when, when we lived in a, in a Cold War, Cold War. I mean, as a young guy, 17, 18, 19, I just lived with a nuclear cloud over my head thinking any minute now one of these buffoons can press a button and that's it and it just took away my motivation and that's basically to some extent what's been happening this year for me and actually with young kids it's happening too uh and um she just said you know and i said i can't get any ideas she said if you want ideas just put the pen in the ink mm. where you start. And that then gets the thing moving within us. And that's all we have to do for ourselves and then, and hold out helping hands to others who want to do the same. You're so right, Donald. Thank you so much. Yeah, finding our own inspiration when we don't have each other to bounce off of, um, you know, that's a that's a whole thing. So thank you for offering that. Someone has said, would you like to recall the memory of rolling into the auditorium on a motorcycle with chains? 
Do I? This was I Los Angeles. Thing? This would be in Los Angeles. Wouldn't Donald like to recall the memory of rolling into the auditorium on a motorcycle with chains, et cetera? Do you remember that? I would like to if I could remember it. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I've just blotted it out of my mind. <laughs> there are a few things that I could like to block out of my mind, but um, the, uh, um, yeah, but uh, good times. And, uh, you know, here, I mean, this is, this shows you, this says it all. Now, you, I mean, Nance, Nancy's got it, uh, um, uh, um, Kitty has it on some of her illustrations. This is one, um, I'm going to try and show it, yeah. Okay, yes, yes. Now, that's a pretty bad picture. There's a certain Nancy, a cheetah straight in the middle there. Yes. And that was 1975. And that was at um, Tahini Campus down in... Uh, 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 LA and um, the uh, you know and there's uh, all quite a number of people one would know there I mean there's, there's Homer Edwards I can see um, yes uh, and also Dolores is on there too and others that were sort of uh, old stages are all about the period that you're talking about and Chuck McInnes and that but um, th everybody's smiling but um, and joking, and you know, it isn't all you know serious. It's also good laughs. Yes, thank, thank you. Yes, um, and thank you, Donald. I'm going to to get you off the spot right mm -hmm. now, so you don't have to worry. I, and uh, there's love being sent to Mab Mabel, walking yeah. in the background. And she too, yes. Um, I may have to slope away as well, but uh, later. But I will. I'll leave a message. I'll 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 wave. I, my daughter taught show me how to do a um, a sort of this gadget, the sort of that. <laughs> a react. And, yes. And, yes. Uh, that's hand I, clapping. I that yes. Tonight. Okay. Uh, that's it. So <laughs> I'll just for the time being, I'm not leaving. I, I'm just gonna let you carry on. Cut me off. Yeah. Hang on. But but we love having you here. I I know that. You know, if we were arra to arrange an evening with you or uh, you know whatever it. People would be flocking well, this here. Shows the way we can do it. Yes, I would love it. I would love it. Always, always. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to um, we're going to just go back to general view for a minute, and um, everybody's really saying how you know this has changed their lives. So many of us uh, understand that and know that. Barbara Wampel would like to share a, uh, Barbara, I'm looking for you. So start to speak, there you are. Uh, you want to share something. I see your hand, Darlene. Will you, I'm gonna spotlight you. And if you would unmute, then we can, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get Donald. Okay, Barbara, you are on, you wanted to share. Yep. If I can, I'll just get these little things off my screen so I can see that I'm doing what I want you to see. You are, you're, you're full screen except yeah. on the top. I, it occurred to me that somebody may have inherited the things that were Harold Adler since he didn't have children. He was one of the founding members. And um, back in 1989, I, or before that, so just sometime before that, I crossed paths with him because someone said I should talk with him I had gone to a swap meet out here in the Santa Clarita Valley and found a whole packet of things in a box at a swap at the Saga swap meet that were from Harold Adler's family that when he died, they just got tossed and somebody brought them to the swap meet. There was everything in there from letters from his great grandfather from his civil war to his wife, an invitation to the White House. But mostly the thing that caught my attention was a small, handwritten Boy Scout um, promise that he had apparently written when he was, that Harold Adler had written when he was a child and he went on to become a designer in Hollywood. And um, uh, sorry, not Harold Adler. The person whose things were at the swap meet were not Harold Adler's. I'm sorry, I misspoke from the beginning. The person's name who had all these things in the box in the swap meet was named Cornette Wood. And his family were the ones that had letters from the American Civil War and so on. And someone said, you should talk to Harold. What I thought was something in there gave me an inkling that he may have been involved with early calligraphy society founding. 
And it turns out that he didn't live, I don't, I'm not, yeah, he did not have anything to do with the founding of our group, I don't think, but Harold knew him because in the 1950s, they had tried to form a calligraphy group. And I believe it was um, a core of people were people who did titles for motion pictures. They did calligraphy. You'll see it in titles for older films where they were doing titles for motion pictures. In the meantime, um, when at some point in 1989, he and I were talking about, um, and he had a small studio at that time in, um, I think it was considered Burbank, not far from on Verdu near Verdugo and Burbank. Um, anyway, he wrote, he wrote me a note um, and sent me these photocopies. So I don't have the originals. I, I keep wondering if somebody wants to speak up that they know what happened to Harold Adler's things. So the issue of Cornette Woods, the reason why I got in touch with Harold. So he wrote this incredible, he always was, people may also know that Harold wrote letters to his wife who traveled. He hand calligraphed letters to his wife because she traveled for a living and he didn't see her. So he would write these incredibly beautiful hand written really romantic, wonderful, sweet, heartwarming letters to his wife. That it would also be nice if people knew what happened to those because again, they had no children. So someone may have gotten them. But in the meantime, he, write, he would write, you know, Madame Barbara Wampole. Just a little it was closer just to the screen. screen. A little closer you to your it. camera. Yeah, Madame. It was, yes. he, would, he was just the sweetest person. He was incredibly sweet. But what he sent in the envelope was a copy of, um, this was the, the page to him. And I believe uh -huh. it was sent to him by, I want to say it was Maury, but I, anyway. You can see that's the handwriting to him in 1952. And it's an invitation for these, this group of people to come together. And he wrote little notes on it. This is the back of the postcard. He hand wrote it. And I, I think that's sealing wax. Um, mm -hmm. And then yes. this is, and then there's the map and the address is, um, I think, did he say it was the home of, Rudy, Rudy's Flint Ridge Tavern they met at Oakwood on Tuesday, April 8th, 1952. The society will meet at the home of Cornet Wood at 5101 Oakwood, La Cunada. I guess uh, Rudy's, Rudy's Flint Ridge Tavern was a landmark um, up in La Cunada. So there's, there's this little map that yeah. he wrote. And nice. Anyway. Yes. Um, Harold Adler's it's, it's, um, letters were on were at one of the exhibits that we had uh, through the years. Right, I remember we try to that. do it every two years, and I think a few of them were published in one of the calligraphs at some point along the way. But they were amazing and wonderful. I agree. Are they in? A, are they in our archive, or are they with someone? Uh, I can't speak to that. Maybe someone else can. Anyway, they're they're a wonderful. Um, um, addition to just the beautiful letters, the beautiful sentiments that came. Yes, with them. and anyway, and people all. are saying thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much. People are saying in the chat, and and we know this, but it's good to remind ourselves how um, <laughs> when you have something that's been handwritten by somebody like that. I mean, you know, just general things, letters that I find from my mom. You know how how wonderful they are. Um, anything and. With calligraphy, they're even that bit more special because someone has taken not time to write you, but taken the time to learn that, to be able to share that and write with you. And um, so, you know, Salima and others are saying, you know, when I when I see something that my my one of my parents have written or, you know, something from the, it just it just brings back so much heart. And I think that's that's really why so many people the way they do is because this is really all about the heart and the hand extending that heart onto paper. It's just so incredible. So um, I don't know, Bruce, do we want to go back to you to say anything? Bruce, do you have anything more to say? Well, I could say um, how we're looking, especially through Donald and, and other comments, we can see how calligraphy has proliferated from what was a barren desert now to rich foliage that's international. I mean, going when we, uh, when my family and I left to move to Spain, and I 
gave up editing and designing the calligraph. It didn't stop there. Uh, I wound up doing calligraphy on the island of Mallorca and it, it, it became a mark of our little village to see calligraphy. And I would do uh, silk cream t-shirts that people would do logos for people with lettering and, and uh, the local uh, group that cleaned up the bay. It was a, it was a group of children, young people, uh, and it, they, they came together to clean up the shores of this beautiful island and they would, uh, they would have weekend cleanups. And so I made a, a logo for them and put it on t-shirts. So they, they would go through the village with these and people would identify the, the good cause. Uh, and I was called to, to speak before the Design Institute and a, uh, an architect uh, design studio owner uh, hired me to train his uh, his staff and and uh, others around the, the city of Palma to come. They were they were doing. He was he was offering a course in design in, in letters on the Mac. This is back in the day, so it was a real breakthrough, and people were doing amazing things with the Mac that had never been done with with um, Microsoft software. And he asked me to come. Because these, these kids came in, they had no idea what a letter was, or anything about the history. So he called on me to talk about the history of letter form. For some, a couple of years, I would go into Palma and I would have a, have a, cut a quill, cut a reed, uh, use a brush, show where the Romans came from, how they were done, why versals came into being through the edgeward movement of the, of the brush. Uh, bring a chisel, carve a letter or two. And so all of these designers on the island and somewhat beyond, some came from off island, began to learn about letter forms just because that was part of that progression from, from Lloyd Reynolds and uh, through Donald and through Jackie Sparr and then through these wonderful people who who brought so much to me and then in my way bringing it on to others through either design or through the, the, the society and then through just passing it on as donald was saying share you got to share and it's been a wonderful thing to see that that's still going on and that society is a kind of channel for that to happen so i congratulate all of you, and particularly today, Kitty, for her effort in doing this. And wonderful to have Donald with us. Oh, um, and that's incredible. <laughs> and, and Bruce, I, I asked you a question just this last week about McManus and Morgan down near the um, Lake, Lake Merritt. Is that right? Uh, oh, yeah. no, yes, Park. and, and uh, I'm sorry, Lake? Echo Park. <clears throat> Echo Park, and um, they were one of the places that that I went to uh, for paper and things, and they're still they're still there, barely, but they're still there. And I'm encouraging everyone to to go down and visit them, McManus and Morgan, because they they have been a provider for us. Uh, yes, um, for for, um, for all these years. years. Many, years. many, many years, and your your signs. I don't know if they're still in the on their uh, window. That your lettering, your work is on their was their all their cards and everything. All your logo work for them, yeah. and so I associated you with with that uh, mistakenly. But um, I encourage people to keep their keep their um, business going if you can. They have they have a website, McManus and Morgan. You can go on and see some of what they offer. And if you want special papers and things, they are one of the LA um, providers of wonderful, wonderful things. Yeah, can, so thank you. Order them. And if you tell Larry, the owner, uh, that you're coming through the auspices of the society, that will get his attention as well. There we go. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking for whomever um, else wants to speak officially before we open it up to everybody. Is there anyone else who wants to offer something? If you put it in the chat, I can see it. And, um, and, and especially 
comment. We have um, Chris Ewan is here and um, I know her through the, <laughs> hello, Chris. I know her through the uh, Orange County uh, Regional Group, which I love and am part of. And um, if you look on the Society for Calligraphy, the, the regional groups are telling what, they're, what they do. Sandy Doer is here from, also from Orange County Group. And uh, Sylvia Call is, the, is in the um, Valley Group, right, Sylvia? And, well, I see you all over the place. <laughs> we, you know, we can't have the retreat this year because we have, um, we, you know, gather yet safely. So that's, that's whatever. Um, and um, so, and uh, I'm being reminded that Ard, Aardvark Letterpress is next to McManus and Morgan. And um, right. keeping Gary going, keeping all of these people going th through our interests is really important. And um, so, uh, Nancy, you have your hand raised. So let me come to you. And and uh, people want to know more about you anyway. So this will give us a chance to know more, maybe about your background and um, and how's it? How's the calligraphy in England? You can unmute yourself, Nancy. Unmute yourself, honey. Nancy, unmute yourself. There you go. There you go. Okay. What are the questions do people want to ask of me? Oh, well, some people want to know, I guess, a little bit more about you or your background, but um, what's going on in England right now? Uh, well, uh, the virus is the most important thing. <laughs> yeah, true. They watch a lot of politics of the Brexit. Nobody quite understands what the Brexit uh, deal is going on. I don't think... I don't think people knew what they were voting for. So there's a lot of politics in the air, which is not always so happy. And every... I mean, I can tell you personally, I've, I've developed my garden from last year and I made it into raised beds uh, and it's wonderful. It's, I just love, I just decided last year, this is going to be a holiday. I mean, because I couldn't teach with the, uh, the virus. And so what I did instead is I said, I'm gonna make this a, a, a holiday where I can have a project. And my project was to completely redo my back garden. We lived on a hill with very, uh, like so many villages along the south coast with lots of chalk. And so I made raised beds out of railway sleepers, oak, and they are beautiful. We filled those all up with nice compost. And I, and this year I'm going to be my first year I've, I've ever had a greenhouse and raised beds. I mean, put a new deck on the back of the house. Now our house is about 60 years old and we had these little concrete steps that came from the back, the kitchen door and the lounge door. So you'd walk out and immediately you're precarious on a little cliff edge, a two by four foot sort of little thing that you would balance on, hold your keys while you're opening up their, your back door, groceries in one hand. And I, both David and I had fallen from it. So I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm getting older. I want some comfort in my life and safety. And, you know, you go through this, this stage in your life where you say, it's time to take care of myself. I've been taking care of you know other people and my parents and you know friends and you, you get to the stage where you say just a minute I can I'm starting to go down the hill a little bit now and I thought this is the time to take care of yourself and nurture and the things that you always wanted to do the things that you always thought about and never had time to do I said boy this is really great I don't have I have extra time and uh, I really have actually actually it was I just loved working in my garden and I'm picking out all these beautiful seeds and blossoms and collecting the roots. And, you know, I go to people's gardens and say, oh, can I have a little bit of that and a little bit of this? And every time the flower blossoms, I think of that person that I, I received that plant from. So and, Nancy, uh, are you still in Shoreham then? Yes, we're still in Shoreham, yes, yes. That's great, I do have a technical question, cutting back to calligraphy. Is Corneliuson still still happening in London? Yes, yeah. as far as I know, they're still in London. Yes, yes. Wow. Great, fabulous story. I think, I think I think that so many people have because of this virus. They've they. Uh, I know that the owner Nicholas Walt has not been in London for I I don't know almost a year, but his shop, as far as I know, is still operating. Most people are operating kind of on a slower level. You know, yeah, things have kind of slowed down. I think so they have mail order, the don't they? They were 
they were there a couple of years ago when I was in London. Oh, they um, have great mail order. They have great mm-hmm. mail order. But if you go to buy automatic pens, buy it from me. Because I have <laughs> <laughs> a little advertisement here. Uh, because I have the cheapest pens in Europe. I still even have some of the pens with wooden handles. Yes, I have a set of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nancy, so I, I have... Um, I have the, you know, the, oh, yes, the tapes, yes, that, that, um, the, these were so, one, the, these are so wonderful. One of mine got kind of eaten up in a, in a bad tape machine, but um, I know that it was David out in the garden sketching and doing things like the piece behind you. Um, yes, he, he would take yes. a, a board and tack on some paper and go outside with a jacket and a hat and gloves, and he would just work out there. And, and do the preliminary drawings of the daffodils or the roses. And then he, when he came back in the studio, he would add the poetry. But he, I saw him out there when it was s- snow and rain. And I mean, <laughs> I mean really, and, and he would say, oh, look, the, 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 the first blossoms of this tree have just come out. I got to go outside and do it. Well, I'm the one with the hot water bottles and the little seat and carry the chair and all of this and put up a windbreak for him. But, it, this whole, I think our whole relationship was about supporting each other to do the things we would like to do. And he was such a, he was so funny. I mean, you know, when I first met him, Richard Stumpf was uh, behind me and I said, Richard, what's he like? And he said, he doesn't say much, but every word he says is important. And I found that to be really true. He was, because he grew up poor and through the war and depression, he was very, very frugal. I mean, he would say things like um, a pair of tennis shoes. You know, when the rubber sole starts to get thin and it wears out and there's a hole in the bottom of your foot. He would, I tried to take a pair of his old tennis shoes out and put it in the dustbin. And you know what? Later that afternoon, he was creeping it back and put it underneath (laughs) the bed. And I thought, and about a couple years later, I had a flat tire on my bicycle. And he took those tennis shoes out, paired the sole, made this, made the little rubber fixture, glued it on my bicycle, and that that patch has always worked. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, I know that we're not in video anymore, but do you still have copies of this? Uh, I'm trying to get some uh, on, onto some. Um, I'm working on that book for David, so we want uh-huh. oh great sections of it in a. Uh, probably in a memory stick because we've we're moving on from the technology keeps changing right so we have to kind of keep up with the technology yeah so memory we, stick would be fabulous fabulous so so it's going to be a combination book and i think uh, mentioned that hmm? uh, i'm getting questions about ordering the automatic pens from you oh great <laughs> And Janet, can you also, after Nancy, look at the participants? We have some raised hands. Yes, okay. I will. Okay. Why uh, don't we get some questions? How to order from, from you? Way. Yes, can, you can order pens from me. How? Yes, how? Just send me an email. Just say what you want, and I'll tell you the price and uh, the shipping and the insurance, and then you can do a wire transfer, and I'll send the pens to you. Okay, do you want to put your, your email in the chat that, that people can see? Is yeah. that okay with you? Yeah. So yeah, do you want fine. to put that, do that for us, Nancy? Can okay, you do right. that for us? Okay, okay. Right. and uh, Salima is wanting to say goodbye to you. Uh, so we will give her a chance that she wants to thank you. So I'm looking for, oh, there you are. Um, so let's let's let you do that. Thank you so much. This has just been a wonderful day for me. I really appreciate it. It's brought back a lot of things that I had not remembered or even things I didn't know about my dad and my family. And so I have to go now. I'm sorry, but thank you again so much and goodbye, everybody. And thank you so stay much. Stay well. Stay well, everyone. Thank you for your contribution. Bye thank bye. you. Everybody's bye. waving to you. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. Uh, so Nancy, I'm looking. I'm. I'm oh, I'm sorry. I got in the too. chat. No, that's. I interrupted you. I I apologize for that. Could and you, um, could, you, could you print yes. print out some of the chat comments because it, I I didn't 
Could you print out you some can. of the chat can you do Thank that? Thank you. That you know what? So for everybody down in the in in your chat box in the lower right hand corner, there's three dots, and you can say save chat, and the whole chat will be saved to your. Uh, thank you for reminding me. Will, will be saved to your machine. So that's um, you can all do that. Uh, and, I, and when you know what, I'll give you a signal. You can do it before you leave if you're leaving individually. And, um, and I can give a signal to say, okay, we're going to be ending. Go ahead and go down to those three little dots and do save chat if you wish to have that. So we'll, we'll do that. Um, and I'm going to unspotlight you for the moment. Nancy, Eva Lynn Please wants to ask a question. Please. Okay, Eva Lynn, so wonderful to see you. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. So Evelyn, uh, I mean, you have to unmute yourself. So Evelyn, Evelyn, you have to unmute yourself. Evelyn, there you go. <laughs> You're not muted. You are muted now. OK. I can't read lips as well as I might. <laughs> you don't have an earphone thing in there, do you? No. I, it, well, oh, there you go. You're here. You're here. Good. OK. It wasn't unmuting. OK. Um, so I just want to say that I studied with Nancy for three years on Tuesday mornings. Well, first, the first class was at Every Woman's Village. But for three years, I was at her Santa Monica studio. My kids were not allowed to get sick on Tuesday mornings. No way. Um, and from Nancy, I learned how to do printing. We made a cookbook, a few cook, um, and she had um, a Sheila Waters uh, for one or two classes. I mean, she was uh, visiting at this time, and um, I learned so much from Nancy. She was a wonderful teacher and inspiration, and I can't thank you enough for all that you've given me. And, I, and you introduced me to bookbinding. We went to the bindery on Melrose and um, we did one little, it was a cover. Oh, we did a notepad cover and we did another thing. Um, and then later I went back to the bindery and took more classes. So I can't thank you enough for all that you've given me. Gosh, this is 40 years ago or something, 35 years ago. No. So, yes, um, my first. Who is counting, Nancy? Who's right. counting? <laughs> Love continues. <laughs> my first class with Nancy was in 1977. 